And welcome to the March 17th meeting of the Arvin School Committee. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. With introductions down here to my right, please. Sonal Large, Elmet Ward 4, Pam Hart, Ward 2, Karen Matthew, Ward 3, Connie Brown, Superintendent of Schools, Faith Fontaine at Large, Ben Poshon, Ward 5, Frank Carrier, Mayor's Representative, Abigail Fonche, Student Representative, All right, and Corn McGuigan has an excused absence for this evening. All right, we're going to begin this evening with a budget, wor budget workshop going over cost centers 8 and 9, which are maintenance and transportation. The regular meeting will follow. Thank you very much. So this time we're going to turn it over to Mr. Hunter, Mr. Hanson, to talk about the transportation and facilities. Well, well, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. And uh, we'll start off with cost centers eight, of, uh, eight and nine of transportation facilities and maintenance. Uh, the Auburn Transportation Fleet consists of uh, 38 buses, 24 of which are your to and from school. We have 14 spare buses. Uh, we purchased four new buses in FY21, two are general fund, and two are CRF fund. All daily buses are 2016 or newer, so we have a fairly new fleet in good shape. Uh, no bus purchase. Request an FY22 budget this year. That 38 buses, 34 were conventional buses, 77 passengers. Four of those have wheelchair lifts. One transit, which is a little bit larger, that flat nose bus that you sometimes see that does a lot of trips. It has a lot of storage underneath, so that's why we have that. Three mini buses, and all three of those have wheelchair lifts also. Of those buses, nine of them are gasoline powered buses, 21 are propane powered, and eight are still diesels. The eight diesels are the oldest ones that we're trying to work our way out of. Our van fleet we have five eight passenger vans, we have eight seven passenger vans. We purchased four student transportation vans from the CRF money. Vans have historically been purchased through our CIP. <laughs> so, Auburn Transportation staff, they, the director of support, so, excuse me. Director of Support Services, which is point five. You'll see that come up again on the cost center nine, which is maintenance. Um, we have a transportation manager. We have an admin assistant, uh, which is the same as just the, the director, but you'll see that one come up again. There's another half-time position there in maintenance. 24 bus drivers, 17 of those are two and from school. One trip bus driver, six special education drivers. Four special education van drivers, six special ed transportation aides, 1.5 mechanics, which is a reduction of 0.5 for, uh, from this year. Uh, bus driver's uh, budget is 11000 added to the budget due to the new earned paid leave law. So our total salary and benefit budget is $1,255,786. The transportation non staffing costs, professional services, $4,400 for the physicals uh, and the random drug testing that we have to be part of uh, for the drivers. Software is $17,879, which uh, is our Verizon GPS program that's in every one of our buses, including the maintenance fleet, uh, and trip scheduling software. Our insurance costs are $74,522. Repair and maintenance on those vehicles is budgeted at $93,518. Contracted vehicle repairs and supplies. 
travel is $2,500. That's primarily the Easy Pass account. We lose a lot of time. Entire account is $22,920. Office supplies is $4,800. Fuel is $130,604. And contractor special education slash homeless budget is $105,500. Staff recognition is $400. Total non-salary slash benefit cost is $457,044. Cost and a total budget is $1,712,830. Increase of $56,225 or 3.29%. And part of that is the director's salary, half of that's the director's salary going into that. Just to add to that, you talked about last week that some of the principals and assistants were shifted. We also shifted part of Billy's director's salary into transportation just to be more accurate in where we're putting things. So that was sort of part of that along the same lines, just to clarify that's what that was about. Do you pre-purchase the fuel? Do you walk into a fuel truck for a year? You are. Yeah. Propane and regular gasoline, we are. The diesel, we are not anymore because we use very little diesel. Those diesel buses are spare buses. Those are not going to be able to use it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
in the evening and half time at Franklin and at the ROTC building was $575,631. We also have some service contracts for our boiler and climate control systems, which is $83,911. We have a roof contract for maintenance, which is $28,050. We have quarterly elevator inspections, which is $6,300. Waste disposal and recycling is $31,097. Now, utilities of the water and sewage is $84,264. Our natural gas is $328,584. The DQ is of $16,793, or 4.86%. Electricity is $347,709. The DQ is of $8,301, or 2.33%. Propane and kerosene is $22,491. All our facilities are on propane, except for that we have one portable trailer at Auburn Middle School, which is an outside heating unit, which is used with kerosene. I was just going to add, Mr. Simpson may ask, yes, we do lock in our electricity and natural gas. We did those competitively. And that led to some of the savings you see, or the reduction from FY21 to FY22. Thank you, because this time I was going to ask, how do you know? How do you know there's a decrease? Thank you. So this is a little slide of our facility inspection programs that we have. All our vehicles are inspected weekly. Monthly, we have a program that inspects the exit lights, emergency lights, and all the fire extinguishers. We have a quarterly program, which is the sprinklers, elevators, air filters, and the AEDs. An annual inspection of the boilers, fuel tanks, fire alarms, intrusion alarms. The bleachers at two schools, three schools. Gym divider curtains. Basketball hardware, which is the basketball frames and hoops. Surveillance cameras and fire hydrants. Repair maintenance costs. Construction projects, $30,000. Custodial supplies, $103,005. Maintenance supplies, $60,151. Fields and ground supplies, slash maintenance, is 47,240, which also includes our playground chips that we put in the playgrounds. Repair and maintenance, $219,796. Which includes the heat and boiler maintenance decreased by $13,969, or 9.34%. Gas and maintenance, gasoline for the maintenance vehicles is $10,270. Ties and supplies and maintenance for the maintenance vehicles is $14,870. There are no new security cameras coming this year, which is a decrease of $24,925. Just a little bit more on that. We have a really good stock of spare parts right now, and our cameras are in good shape, so we thought there was no need to fund anything for next year. That may return in the future, however. The Alton Facilities Other Costs, Insurance, $74,129. Facility Software, $16,290. Work Orders, which is Work Orders and Asset Management. Postage Fees is $5,800, and the telephone is $41,964. Debt Service, Minor Capital Debt Service is listed under Cost Center 9, which includes the CIP projects, the Revolving Renovation Funds, the QZAB Funds, the Siemens Performance Contracts, to the total Minor Capital Debt Service of $1,748,843. Deduction of $109,518. Expiring debt is greater than the new CIP debt this year. Cost Center 9 total budget, $5,007,244, which is a decrease of $159,650 to 3.09%. And that is it. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Any questions for Mr. Hunter right now? 
Dr. Nunn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, You're welcome. I think that brings us to the end of our conferences as well, doesn't it? It does. Yes. Uh, and if I might, um, I'd like to propose an amendment to the budget calendar. So we have a uh, meeting scheduled for the 21st of March to talk about debt, all other areas such as crossing guards, result ads, and revenues. And talking to Mr. Hansen, we don't think that's going to take a long time, probably no more than a half an hour. So what we'd like to do that evening is reserve the other hour and a half for your deliberation, determination of what to do you'd like to send to your public hearing, and cancel the March 31st budget meeting if that's acceptable to the school committee. And the opposition to canceling and condensing everything to March 24th? Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so that'll be a change on the agenda when we get to it. Just a moment. All right. Thank you again. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Julie. All right. Uh, moving along to the consent agenda. I do want to make one change to the consent agenda this evening. I'd like to use Chair Prerogative to move item um, A under new business, which is the awarding of the contract for the new Edward Little High School. I would like to move that to just after public participation. Uh, the representatives from both the architect firm of Harriman as well as uh, the potential contractor, Mr. Art Dudley, are sitting in the back here. Uh, they're here with us this evening, so hopefully there'll be no exceptions to that. So with that, can I entertain a motion for the approval of the next consent agenda, which includes the approval of minutes from March 3rd, please. So moved. Okay, Brian, uh, Terry, I'll take your second. Any questions or comments about that? Second. All right, seeing none, all those in favor? None opposed, motion passes. All right, at this time, we're going to open the meeting up to public participation, uh, and there is a chair and seat here available. Just a reminder that this portion of public participation is for any item that is not on the agenda right now. I will open up public comments um, on specific agenda items as we progress through the meeting. Do we have anyone in the community room who would like to come in and speak on public participation at this time? No one's in the room. very difficult. I wish her shadow was going to be back. She doesn't know if she does. Oh, you think she's in there? Are we all set? Okay. All right. We're going to close public participation. So let's move on to item uh, new business A, the awarding of the contract for the new Edward Little High School. It has been a long time coming in this. Four years of planning and prep um, has brought us to this moment. Um, so I would like to extend my many thanks to the building committee for their long hours of service um, that they've given and gotten us here to this point. So with that being said, we'll open the motion, we'll make the motion, have the discussion uh, at that point. So can I entertain a motion to authorize the superintendent of schools to enter into a contract with Arthur C. Dudley in the amount of $104,704.304 million. <laughs> wow. That was a deal. That was a great deal. Sorry, Mr. Dudley. I'm sure you had a minor heart attack <laughs> Back that one up. One hundred and four million. Wow, I just got the taxpayers of Auburn a really good deal on this, right? One hundred and four million seven hundred four thousand three hundred and sixty two dollars, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. Thank you, Pam. All right, let's open it up for conversation at this time. Any conversation? I will say the building committee has said it's just one. Um, it's really been hours and hours and hours. So I'm um, going to please present it to you this evening. Any questions, comments, all of the last um, presentation was uh, part of your onboarding package this evening as well. We have Pam, um, Lisa and Mark from Harriman are here. It's nice to see you in person and not on the Zoom screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, seeing no, seeing no questions or comments at this time, there's a motion on the table. All those in favor of awarding the contract to our staff lady? All those in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Dudley. Thank you. Well, 
uh, be forewarned, I was here that you have your truck pretty much ready to go tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. You are ready to roll. Am I correct? So I will recap for those who've been here. We're just waiting for the temporary fencing that is a couple hundred miles away. We'll, just, we'll be here on, on Friday morning. So at this time, Dr. Graham is going to step up for just a moment. She has a contract that she needs to go sign with Mr. Bubba now. All right. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Okay, moving along, the presentation of uh, the Reentry Steering Committee is here tonight to talk to us about some recommendations for maximizing in-person learning. Yeah, so if there are members from the steering committee that are in the community room, we are inviting you to come on in. Committee here tonight to present to you. Uh, as you know, at the February 3rd school committee meeting, uh, the school committee approved the steering committee recommendation to use Wednesdays to bring alternating cohorts back into school. Uh, this was a step, uh, but not a destination in increasing in person learning. So tonight we have uh, members from the steering committee here, uh, and they'll be presenting to you the recommendations uh, coming out of the steering committee to continue to increase in-person learning. I was in preparing for this tonight. I was, remi I was reminding, um, reminded of the fact that members of this school committee have been committed, expressing their commitment to bringing our students back into school as soon as possible while maintaining safety. And so it's with that in mind that the steering committee has been doing its work. And just one minute, if I might, I just would like to recognize these are some of the members of the committee. This is probably of the steering committee um, who were able to be here tonight. They were all invited, but they were, these were the folks who, who um, were able to come. But I just would like to recognize them. The, the task that they've undertaken, um, some from the beginning of the school year to now, most recently, has been monumental. And I say it's just increased in, in its um, monumental stature of, of a task. So I just want to recognize them tonight. Many hours, um, certainly being diligent and open-minded in addressing the goal that came out of, again, from hearing from the school committee um, about the direction that, that was important uh, for our students. So the goal in mind uh, that, they, that we used in our meeting uh, here is the, to increase in-person learning while maintaining the current safety guidelines. So those safety guidelines are masking, the hand hygiene, and they all fall under those six guidelines to reopen school, the distancing being maintaining in the current level of six feet. So just real clear on that. Okay. The recommendation you've seen in your packet, but the recommendation tonight 
that you will be discussing and deciding upon later in the agenda is, number one, high support needs students from pre-K to eighth grade will attend school five days a week. And the second part is all students in cohorts A and B in grades 9 through 12 will attend school five days a week. You can see that, well, what happened to me? I got booted off. Let's see if I can't get back on. The way that we went, the committee went about deciding on how we would determine the number of students in the pre-K through grades 8 who would come back into the school would be contingent on the amount of space available. So there was a great deal of work that was done, has been done over and over really again by building administrators to determine what exactly the space is available given the guidelines that have been put in place. And it was determined that we could not bring in all of our students, but how many students can we bring in? And that was a difficult part of this exercise was determining that. But the spaces that were identified that we could in each classroom bring students back in, we needed to bring more students back in, we wanted to maximize those numbers to the greatest degree possible rather than just let them sit back where there were spaces that we could fill. And then the second part for the pre-K through grades 8 is we will begin to have those students invited back working with families as early as March 22nd. But by April 5th, we will have identified and students will be attending. So that gives them time to make those contacts, to have those meetings, to set up those plans and have students come in. The high school students will begin that five-day in-person schedule at the start of the fourth quarter on April 5th. And we'll hear more about that as we move through the presentation. The proposal is based on a few things. Like I said earlier, it maintains the guidelines and the safety strategies that we've put in place. It also utilizes the current and, I have to say, highly successful procedures and protocols that are in the schools now. We'll hear a little bit about that at the high school in particular. Stable cohorts will remain and be expanded. So you may have heard about crossing cohorts. So right now we have cohorts A and B for the sake of organizing and letting people know when they come to school. When I say stable cohorts, when we talk about stable cohorts, I'm talking about for contact tracing purposes. So the stable cohort will now be expanded from maybe eight students who come on Monday and Tuesday to 12 students who come on any day during the week in, let's say, Ms. Pierce's classroom. So that will be the cohort now, and that cohort will remain stable. So we have very small numbers in our cohorts. Those numbers are going to increase, not by a lot in most cases, but the cohort will be stable. In other words, they won't be crossing into other cohorts to the degree possible. That maintained to the degree possible is no different than right now. We do have some situations where we do have some crossing, and that impacts us when we have, if in the case that we would have to contact trace a positive case. Parent involvement in the decision making. Parent involvement in the decision making. We will be contacting parents in the upcoming days to let them know that their student has been identified and make that offer of their participation. Also, we'll be providing transportation and meals to those who have needs. 
uh, are, we have, you'll hear a little bit about that later on in the presentation. And we are able to maintain that. The meals will stay the same because we have, um, we're maintaining the six, in this proposal we're maintaining the six feet. So students will be able to eat in the classrooms and maintain that same process that we use for feeding students. And then we'll continue to um, respond to positive cases in the same way that we can with contact tracing. So that's what this proposal is predicated on. Those are the pieces, the foundational pieces to this, um, this proposal. So I'm going to invite up now um, elementary members of the committee to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like at the elementary level and more specific. So um, if Mrs. Baudrette would come up, Ms. Pierce, and Mrs. Russo. So is a second grade teacher at Sherwood Heights School. Ms. Pierce, where are you this year? Fifth grade this year at Park Avenue School. And of course, Ms. Burdett is principal at the uh, Fairview School. Okay, so um, our level, our elementary level, works on a plan to safely increase in-person learning for our high support needs students. Um, and as part of that plan, we did do a lot of talking about equality, fairness, and equity. And, uh, you know, equal is defined as the same or um, exactly alike. Fair is defined as just or appropriate in the circumstances. And equity is defined as the quality of being fair and impartial. So if you look at equality, it means that each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. So in the diagram, the first group, they each have, uh, they, they have an apple tree, they have a crate, and so they are given the same resources um, for apple picking. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So to the right, we notice that um, additional resources are given to make the opportunity equal. Um, so additional crates are added, two and three in some cases. Um, and really the takeaway is equity can only occur in schools and in society if we are okay with people getting what they need, even if it seems better or more than what someone else is getting. So the considerations that we use to identify our students, um, we looked to see what academic uh, supports they needed or interventions additional to what they were receiving now. We looked at attendance and the lack of remote participation in many cases. Um, we looked at the inability to um, access necessary support on the remote days especially. And then we looked at the safety and well-being of our students. So grade level teachers and support staff uh, work with administrators to make recommendations. So what will it look like? So if you look to the right, um, that is a picture taken today at Fairview School. Uh, the top picture is cohort B, and um, there are seven students in cohort B that were in attendance today. The bottom picture is cohort B expanded, and that has an additional seven students that were added, just for the sake of the picture. Um, what you'll notice is, or you might not notice, but you can't see, because I was up against the wall trying to get the whole classroom. Um, to the, at, in the bottom picture, there's a desk, teacher desk to the right. There's a kidney table to the left that has a place for small group work. There's a table in the front corner and a chair to the left. So no furniture was moved. We just repurposed the desk to, to just show you what an expanded cohort might look like. Um, so what it would look like for students who would be attending five days and Paula can certainly jump in because this is your expertise here in the classroom, but students might have individualized plans, which 
might mean that they do hear a lesson again. Repetition is not a bad – it's a great learning strategy, actually. If they needed to hear the lesson again, they might hear the lesson again. If not, they would be working on whatever work the teacher has deemed appropriate for them, what meets their needs. They would have differentiated instruction. So one thing that elementary teachers do every day, and they do it really well, is differentiate instruction. They have lots of kids in their classroom at different levels, and they're constantly meeting the needs of those students. So using a workshop model helps to do that. A direct instruction, a mini lesson, might be 10 to 20 minutes in length. Then kids go off and do what they're working – what they need to be working on while teachers meet with kids, check in with kids. So a student who's there five days may have participated in that lesson again, or they may have been working on what they need to work, and then the teacher can check on them after. They do have access to that teacher. And then those students would have opportunities for interventions, which might be provided by specialists, special education teachers, counselors, a clinician, and any other support staff that we have. And I think we may need to put that to that. I – for the differentiated instructions, like I have a couple of students who are way higher than the students that I have in my classroom. So they have worked from their enrichment teacher that they work on first, and while I do my mini lesson with somebody else, with the rest of the class, and then I have another lesson with them. So that's basically what it would look like if I had those, you know, students for five days a week. And if anything, this pandemic has only enhanced teachers' creativity and their flexibility. Our multitasking has been enhanced greatly as well. So the advantage with us having our smaller cohorts that we've had, we've really gotten to know our students very thoroughly. And so we're ready to take on more, and we're ready to give them what they need, especially our students that are not maybe participating as much at home. They just – they need to be with us. They need to be in the room getting whatever else we can give them to enhance what they need. It is a good thing I sold out my copy. I was wondering how you did that so well. So some of the considerations that we – no, sorry, we did that. There we go. I already did that. So how many students would be returning at the elementary level? So these are approximate numbers at this point, but approximately 27 students would be asked to return for five days. That's about 17 percent of East Auburn's population. At Fairview, about 105 students would be asked to attend five days a week, and that's about 23 percent of our population. Park Avenue is 86 students attending five days a week. That's 28 percent of their population. Sherwood Heights would be 94 students attending five days a week. That's 29 percent of their population. Walton at 82 with 36 percent of their population. And Washburn at approximately 65 with 26 percent of their population. So it's about 459 elementary school students that we would be looking to bring back five days a week. That's about 27 percent of our total population of elementary school students. And then, of course, most importantly, parents would have final say once their student is invited. Is that your last slide? Yes, that was the last slide for elementary. Okay, so let's open it up to questions for thinking just about the elementary school reentry proposal at this point for elementary. Any questions at this point? So I know you guys kind of figured out the identified students that would be returning. Say if half of those students, their parents decide not to send them back full time, we go to 
the next students on the list is that so every six foot of every classroom be filled. So um, that's a good question. We are not necessarily filling every single seat that's available right now because we're looking at the criteria. Um, with that being said, we know that not everybody, or we're anticipating that not everybody that we invite will um, want, want this. So we would look at other students who could benefit from it. The other piece is um, just because we're asking them right now, um, it doesn't mean that two weeks down the road, they're like, oh, you know, Johnny really could have benefited and something's going on. But, you know, we would have some openings or some space to be to ask kids to join. And then um, my other question is, I know there's other school districts going back full time with the three foot rule. What, how have we explored that? And I know that looks different with eating and other aspects of the daily classroom. Um, but I know other schools are doing that, so can I go speak to that, why we're sticking with the six? Sure. Um, at this point, the, the committee was using the recommendation um, based on the six feet because that has been standard. And so the committee has, in their deliberations, particularly in the time of deliberation um, about this, felt that that was an important piece to stay with. Um, it's changing. It's shifting right now. And as you right. said, in the different school districts, but across the country, they're just being talked about and, 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 uh, and looked at. Do we have the ability, that if that were the decision that were made, to go to three feet and bring people in? We would, we would follow that directive. I think you, if you, have, you have this space for six feet within, within the classroom, but then that has to also be maintained when they're eating as well. So the challenge that would, would have to be addressed is that the biggest challenge, I think you hear at all levels, is to go to three feet would, would, um, would allow that for students, three feet between students. Um, it would still maintain a six feet from what I'm understanding that come, might come, is six feet to adults. Um, and we would still need to maintain six feet when students are eating. And that's the, the biggest challenge, biggest hurdle, the biggest challenge that would have to be addressed. And Michelle, um, to, to go with that, we eat in the room with our children, so they have their seats, and they're very clear on the directions. They have been amazing, the kids. They sit there, and I know with the time they're eating, they stay at their space, and they have their mask off, obviously. Um, but when they need to get up to throw their things out, they just put their masks back on and they wash up. So they follow the protocol better than probably most adults do. Um, so we just have to keep maintaining that protocol. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I have a few questions. Um, first, I'd like to know, okay, you talked about how some depends on the school if we're going to be bring, bringing back more kids who are struggling, what happens if, because um, all our schools are different sizes. We have some larger schools, we have some larger classrooms, um, and we get more kids than others. What if a teacher has five kids who are struggling, but they are um, at a school that is smaller? How will those kids be picked to come back? Which ones will be picked to come back, and which ones will be asked? Come back when they're all struggling and use their like equally struggling at the same time. Um, well, we would use that criteria, we would work with parents. Um, I, there's lots of different factors, so sometimes um, we do have you know kids who are struggling, but we know for whatever reason Johnny's parents don't want him to come back. So it's really kind of knowing your students, knowing your families. Um, if you look at the percentages, actually, so Fairview is um, the largest school, and so we do have space, but my percent is only 23% of my population, where, you know, Walton is 36%, um, Sherwood Heights 29 and Washburn is even right in that average of 26 um, So decisions do have to be made, and um, I think we work together as a team. We work with parents. We look at the students. We look at their needs and, you know, just go from there. 
So if, if it's just going to be the suggestion that you're making is just struggling kids that are coming back. It's not like Jay said, or someone said, I'm sorry, it's not me, um, saying we're not just filling seats. Like if we have the available, the available space in one class, we're not just filling up those seats because we have the availability. We're doing it because just the struggling kids are coming in. Well, and struggling encompasses lots of things. It doesn't. It might not be struggling academically. No. It could be struggling, yeah. you know, socially, emotionally. So um, it encompasses but, uh, lots of factors. Um, but no, we're not looking at, okay, we have X amount of seats and we're filling all of those. And one of the reasons we're not doing that is because it's, it's not the same across the district. So I might be, I might have bigger classrooms and I might be able to fit a lot more kids in than Washburn who have smaller classrooms and more, and is more restricted. So that's why the criteria helps us to kind of stay focused on um, what kids we're looking at for right now. I think the other thing that, and I know that Michelle and we had talked about this earlier this week, was that I just got a new student. So, um, you have to like you have to have that flexibility. So if you fill all your seats and you have a student move in, where is that student supposed to go? So I think you have to look at everything and have some flexibility. That like you need to have some seats open because not you know you, you are going to have those students that move in. And, you know we're looking at our kids. As, you know we we'll have our two cohorts at this point right now, and we have our kids coming in that. We look at how they're doing all the remote work. They participate in every Zoom we do. They um, participate in the classroom. So those are our, our stronger, not always just higher, but they do have supports in place. And some of them are just internally motivated. But then you have other kids that just they, they're not able to sit at home and follow my Google Classroom plan when they're not with me. Um, they don't have someone, oh, did you check number two? Did you do number three? Did you, did you read this attachment? Um, so there's so many things that we have to look at in, as our guidelines to make those determinations. So it's not just two or three little things we're looking at. There's a lot, of, there's a lot to the picture that we're looking at as we make those decisions. So my question is, what is the criteria? Because I'm hearing that the criteria encompasses a lot, but I don't know the specific criteria. Is it grades? Is it truancy? Is it mental health? Is it social okay. emotional learning? So you hit you hit everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all of those things. Yeah. It's, it's not just a check off sheet, and it's not how many do we check off and what number did you get? Oh, you, you win the prize because you have the most. Because one, you know. Safety and well-being might be the only thing checked up, checked up, but that might be the most important factor for that student, and, and so that jumps to the to the top. So once you get the child in school, how will the, how will you guarantee that their needs are met? So if someone comes in and they have social emotional learning, or if they're having mental health issues, are we going to have counselors in the schools addressing those mental health issues? If if it's Grades, is this child going to have more tutoring than they normally would have? What is, what, how do they do what we do every day? So, mm -hmm. you use the word guarantee, and there's never, I'm, I'd love to be able to say I can guarantee that everyone's going to get everything they need. I can't say that in a non pandemic year, right? I can guarantee that we're going to try to give them everything they need. So, we're going, it's going to give us more time with that student, more face time with that student. And yes, our school counselors will be there. We'll, we'll connect them with the resources they need. It's just like we do if they're here only two days a week. Um, it's just that some students could benefit from more. Um, so we're going to do all the things that we do every single day. It's just, and, and no, there's not a guarantee that it's going to work for that student, but I would like to think that something will be better for that student. Something, they'll benefit from something. And those kids too will also, like all of them do, they'll have the opportunity to have a breakfast every morning they come in, a lunch, and a healthy snack. And sometimes that's more than what they're getting at home. Yeah. I guess I, I don't want this to come off as negative, but I'm looking at this list and 
where we had such issues in the past with identifying identified children for this or that. I look at this list that you have up there, and knowing how children can be, I can see that we are setting those children apart from the rest of the school, and I think that that's not what we, that's not our purpose here. I know that that's going to do it. I look at intervention and say, those kids are not as academically progressed as other kids. Lack of remote participation due to the family issues. They, they may not have the funds to do it. Parents not, may not be able to stay at home and deal with the children. Same with inability to access the needed support. Parents may not be able to be at home to help the children do that. And the safety and well being. Again, we're talking about parents that are not as well off, maybe, that they have to be at work and are not able to provide this. They can't take them to daycare. So, what I'm seeing, why I hear what you're saying. I say, I can see right there that we're saying, well, the poor kids that don't have the family available to stay at home and help them are not as academically ahead of them. And what we're doing is we're setting them up for mm -hmm. And, I mean, we're just starting the, the equity and the, and the other programs, and I don't want to pigeonhole kids because as much as we say that we don't allow bullying and we don't like setting children apart, all I see is that this is setting those kids apart and it's going to set them up, you know, for whatever it is that the kids do now. I, I know from having grandkids that there's still bullying going on in schools. I know that there's still all kinds of stuff that we're trying to get away from. That. We're doing our very best to get away from that kind of stuff. And I'm not really seeing where this is helping us do that. I mean, I understand that it's helping us address one little issue. But by doing what else? And we may be addressing this issue, but what else are we setting those kids up? So, what conversations have you had about what that would look like, and how, as as elementary school um, staff, you are going to, you know, work against we do kind of the stigma? Yeah, we spoke of that actually in our when we were meeting today, and how kids are so flexible and. Many of our kids are already leaving our classrooms in front of their peers to go to counseling or to, to OT or PT or to special ed uh, Zooms or their intervention groups, and they love doing that. The other kids want to join them, actually, so they don't look at it as something that's negative. Um, and as far as bullying, we have not seen that. I haven't seen any because we don't have uh, we don't we, we don't have a morning recess at this point. Our lunches are together in our room, so we're we're working as a team at this point. I feel like we're teammates right now, and I don't know. I feel like there's more respect than ever right now because of this. I have to say that in our class in in our school, we're a little bit different because I'm at Park Avenue, so. We have a vast diversity of students. And I'm talking about our students in the ELL program. Right now, our students are getting their services via Zoom. So that means, and we're having a lot of push in when they are here in school. So instead of being taken out of the classroom, they're getting the support in the classroom. So it's not necessarily being taken out of the classroom. Um, I, we have support for whether it's special ed, whether it's the ELO program, there's support and all students are receiving that support. So, you know, in my math class, I do have ELO support, but the, the teacher that's with me, she supports all of my students. So it's not necessarily just for those students. So everybody gets that help. Kids are pretty, um, they're pretty amazing and they a lot of times don't even bat an eye and it's it's it just become it's the culture and you know Johnny's going out to get what Johnny needs I'm here because I'm getting what I need um, I'm not saying that it's always perfect and certainly we, we talk and work with students um, who are struggling with that or students who might not be as respectful around some of those issues but for the most part kids are kind of you know I'm here I'm doing my thing, he's doing his thing, she's doing her thing. Um, 
And it might follow that and like Courtney said, pre-COVID and post-COVID, kids are going to be coming and going and getting the supports they need. Um, kids are wise. They know who struggles in the class. The kid who struggles knows they struggle in the class. The kid who struggles can tell you he doesn't struggle in the class. That's an every year pandemic, non-pandemic issue that we work with and we try to build self-esteem and find everybody's strengths. And my strength might be different than your strength. Um, and so it's just part of what we do in, in the culture that, that we build at school. So I, kids are, they're amazing. Yeah, I did actually. Um, I think you've done a really uh, thorough job of this. Um, I think it, it mimics well what Dr. Brown asked us to consider a while ago. I think it's imperative that we all keep in the forefront that I think maybe in January we knew that uh, at least 25% of these kids were challenged, were, were, were having a really, really hard time. Um, I, I agree, kids are resilient. I think the older they get, the more stigma is attached. That, that I'm sure that will be um, considered. My question, or, but, and it's really not for you, Ms. Bodette, um, but at some point last fall, and I don't know when it was, um, I'm on the finance committee. We approved purchasing three modular classrooms that I initially was opposed to. I didn't think we needed more real estate. And what swayed my vote was um, a person said, this will get kids back in the classroom faster. So my question is, are we using these, I think there's three we purchased, are we utilizing these three modular classrooms to bring some, you know, additional elementary kids back to school safely? Thank you. I think it's kind of my answer that we purchased two. We purchased one, Courtney Stroud, and we purchased one in Washburn. I was in the one in Washburn meeting yesterday, looked at the art supplies, which adds new to the classroom, yes, that's being used. The furniture was moved into East Auburn one today. Uh, so I don't see two in here. Could be better for me to answer that specifically, because they are being used. Great. Thank you. So I just wanted to point out in response to Brian and Pam's questions to Celeste about, you know, is this going to label the kids? Is I think what we have to keep in mind that ultimately we're letting the parents choose, and we're offering them an opportunity to get help where it's needed. And ultimately, if the parents are comfortable with sending their children under those preconditions, then they can choose not to. Correct. Correct. So, but we are providing that opportunity for those children. And as a parent. I would like that choice to choose if I was one of those parents. So I think we need to keep that in mind. We're not making these children go to school. So parents do that. Yes, parents do have the time off there. Are So circling back to what um, our assistant superintendent said, um, with contact tracing, there's obviously not a guarantee for always in situations. So I was wondering how the busing schedule is going to work. Now, are we putting more kids, mixing the cohorts on the bus now that there's going to be more or five days a week. What is going on with that? We're going to talk about that on a slide near the end, but just to give you a preview, we're going to be able to do what we've been seeing recently. So we'll talk more specifically about that in a little bit, if that's okay. So um, kind of going back to what Dave had asked about the three feet rule, I know that there's a lot of um, talk right now with studies, one study out of Massachusetts saying that there may not be a significant difference between three and six feet. I know that we now we know a little bit more than we did. Has that even been looked at? And if it was, if the kids were to be three feet, how would that impact? Like, would we be able to bring all the kids back at, at that point? Or would it still be that we had to pick and choose? Because I still am having, I know you did that whole great aspect back then. Go ahead. Yeah. So you ask the question. So bringing all kids back to three feet. Yes, we would. We would. We would be able to bring all students back at the elementary level. There, there would be a presentation on that as well, because there are some situations that we would have to make some accommodations for. But yes, we would be able to bring back all students at the elementary level at three feet. All right. Any other questions right now? No. Yeah. Um, in part what um, Ms. Hart was saying, with all of the students in the room, what about the CDC guidelines with how many 
people are limited to a room, would that just be bypassed, or what would go into that? So this presentation that you heard from the elementary staff tonight is based on six feet. So it's within the guidelines, the guidelines of the main CDC says three to six feet. So we have, in Auburn, have opted for a six foot standard. So this stays within that six, everything you hear tonight will be within that six feet. So now there's a question about utilizing a three foot standard. And so that's the question that was just asked. But yes, we can get students in. There would be some places where there would be need for accommodation to the classroom. But we can talk about that more. Talking about the equity and how equitable this is. I know you did that whole presentation. I just, I still have an issue with the stigmatization and the equality and fairness. I can also see parents, different parents, like let's just say Karen and I are parents and both our kids, we both have struggling kids, but my kid gets in and hers doesn't. How fair is that? I think that we're setting ourselves up here for a lot of disgruntled parents. That's the piece that we want to hold on to for the fact that the motion is made for the debate. Right now this is questions for them so that they can answer for you. So that makes it for everyone so that when you are making your vote, you have had all your questions answered. So the debate comes and the conversation comes with the motion. Okay, I just wanted to say, I should have been a little more clear about that. Sorry. Go ahead. Question. We're talking about utilization of space, excuse me. And the fact that the kids currently stay in their rooms to eat lunch now, have we made utilization of the lunchroom and say the gymnasium or maybe moving the lunchroom to the gymnasium as opposed to give us more space? Or are we currently using the gymnasiums for classrooms and everything else? In most of the classrooms, the gymnasium is being used for PE. So you would displace the PE teacher if you used the gymnasium to eat. At Sherwood Heights, our gymnasium is our daycare room. So our kids that are not in, when they're on their off cohort days, a lot of our children go to our daycare and our gym. And then our PE teacher teaches that in the cafeteria. So that's at Sherwood Heights. So most of your, so your cafeterias and your gyms are being utilized either for daycare on non-cohort days, just to make sure I heard you. And then, like for example, your PE teacher is using the cafeteria in order for kids to have gym. Okay, and I think that's, I think it's different for each school. So that's, yeah, that is correct. At the beginning, way back when we didn't know what the plan was going to be and we didn't know how many kids were going to come back, we did have a plan to use our gym as a cafeteria for space that we need. So. Well, I knew that some of the, some of the space lent itself to a better use than, I mean, you have a large gymnasium and I think automatically these fiber meters. Right. I just wanted to know about the use of the space and what we're currently using it for. But if I'm hearing correctly, the three foot rule doesn't work for eating and now you have no place to eat if we bring them all back because your spaces are being used. Well, if we brought them all back, they still wouldn't be using it going to go. Right, we brought them all back, now we've just, now we've just displaced daycare. Oh, okay. Yeah, we wouldn't need daycare. Oh, we wouldn't need daycare. We don't need daycare. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we don't need daycare if you bring them back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Are they still going out to recess? Yeah, not in the morning, just after they eat their lunch. Okay. And it's only with their cohort. They don't mix cohorts. Any more questions? One more question. This is a question. As far as special, music, gym, art, now you have two cohorts, you're going to have it on, you know, A, cohort A is going to have their special that that week. Cohort B is going to have the same special at the end of the week. How are you going to do it for the kids that come back four days? Are they going to have the same special twice? 
We actually talked about that today, and we thought that those that – who receive interventions would – that would be – if they were those children that would come back for five days, that would be a good opportunity for them to have – be, you know, taken into a small group or whatever. But that would be their, like, intervention time. But they could. You know, there might be a week where they get to have music an extra time. And so right now they are – the way we're doing it is they only have one special per trimester. So they have it multiple times a week already. So they would – they would just get to join in again in some cases. So our specialists have been alternating. So they – for instance, music was the first trimester for one cohort. And then she went to another cohort for trimester two. And so they've stuck with the same cohort. So what they've had to do, though, is when my kids, say, are at home, they have a Zoom with their special one day. And when they're in school, they have a physical special. So they're getting it twice a week because that's how they fit it all in for the trimester. So they wouldn't get it – they might get one additional special if their other interventions, like Courtney said, didn't happen to – you know, if the schedule didn't work out. Okay. Any other questions for elementary? Seeing none, thank you all so much for all the work that's gone into this. Thank you. Middle school. Tanya, would you step in here to see if you can help me with their plan? I did restart. Hey, good evening. I'm Bob Griffin, the principal of the middle school. I'm joined by Sean McGaugh, the middle school assistant principal, and Sue Callahan, a veteran middle school teacher and also one of our team leaders. And I'm going to get things started, but they are going to chime in. They've approached this work from different perspectives. Mr. McGaugh has been part of this reentry committee since its inception last spring. Ms. Callahan and I have joined the work now for the last few months. So to just give you a picture of Auburn Middle School today, and I want to highlight just a few differences about the middle school compared to the elementary and the high school. So today, or as of a couple weeks ago, we had an enrollment of 494 students, 150 of them fully remote. Knowing that there was some increase in demand at the end of the summer for parents wanting to go fully remote, I made the decision to put together a fully remote, dedicated team of teachers. And that has gone very well. So those teachers are still in the building every day, but they're working the same. So I do not expect much movement from fully remote students to coming back in five days. Currently on A days in person, we have about 179 students on B days, 165. You may ask, why are those numbers a little bit lopsided? That is because we have, since the beginning of the school year, accommodated every single parent request for movement. And that hasn't always been easy. And that changes multiple times a week. You know, case numbers might go up. We get calls from parents. They would like their kids to go fully remote. And vice versa. You know, so there's been a lot of shifting, but we have accommodated every single request as the year has gone on. That has caused some of the numbers to be just a little bit different. Now, the middle school, you've heard me mention this before, has teams. Those teams know their students exceptionally well. You know, students may be on a smaller team with two primary teachers, or they may be on a larger team with four teachers. The teachers meet during the week during common planning time. They talk about their students. They know their students' strengths and weaknesses. They know their students' star scores, grades. They know struggles possibly outside of school. They know the social-emotional needs of all of their students. 
in looking at the criteria we have put together, and I appreciated listening to the comments and questions from school committee members with the earlier presentation. Um, I, I, as principal, I'm, I'm worried about I'm worried about things like star scores. Um, I, I'm more worried about the social, emotional health of my students. Um, so that when when I've asked him, when I've tasked team leaders in the last few weeks to begin this work, which they have eagerly taken on, um, that is, you know, I said it, it isn't it isn't all the star scores. We may have a student who is doing okay on their star testing, but is having they're having a really tough time outside of school. And we uh, we we need them in school. We need them where they connect with our um, our interventionist, with our social worker, with our school counselors, and things like that. So the the criteria that I had asked the team leaders and that our group had come up with. You know, as teams will be making recommendations to extend invitations to families. You know, looking at star scores, progress reports, grades, remote attendance, um, and then the, the mental health needs and, and individual needs are, are considered when we're making these recommendations for these students to return um, to five days a week. So, um, again, um, it isn't real easy to quantify the social emotional needs of students, so that is why. We very intentionally did not have cutoffs of. We didn't say they're failing one class or their star score is this. You know, we really wanted to look a little bit more holistically and again leaning toward the social, emotional, and mental health needs of of our of our students. And um, to Mr. Carrier's um, point uh, earlier, this I I am um, and we not not just I um, I've been very thoughtful about, for example, the stigma. And what that may feel like for um, for students to be invited back. That is why this would be an invitation to the families. This would be conversation with the families and with the students. And and I will I will say um, I, I'm not the slightest bit worried about filling slots. Um, I, I think think a lot of kids want to get back to school and they want to connect with with their school counselors and 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 get the, the the meals and all of that all of that other stuff. But I absolutely no one is remanded to this. So I, I want to be really, really clear that this would be um, you know, an invitation that we are extending to the families that they certainly can say um, can absolutely say no. Um, right now um, we have about three hundred and forty four students who are um, who are in person. Um, this what we are pr proposing um, expands, you know, our our, our slots. So we we have 291 seats available at Auburn Middle School. We have um, measured and remeasured and we measured again. And I, I also want to want you to hear from me. I, I made the decision that I was not going to decimate classrooms. I was not going to remove bookshelves from all of the classrooms. Now, if there was stuff that could be removed, we absolutely have removed it and stored it, but it was a priority of mine that we absolutely want to have as many seats and classrooms as we can, but I did not want it to be just this barren cave. You know, it's really important that teachers have access to to their teaching resources. It's important that we have books in, in classrooms and stuff like that. I also want to share with you, um, you know, we, we're, um, my math is going to be great here, um, we're about 55 spaces down. You know, um, with, with 55 more spots, we could, we could have, have our students back. Um, there, there are two primary challenges with that. Um, one is space. I, I also made the decision that um, I think the middle school library is a really important place. I think it's really important during the pandemic. We have been putting out a ton of books that students are bringing home, so I did not um, close our library and put a classroom in there. Now, even if I did, I don't have adults to supervise that. Um, we have been down multiple positions every day of the school year, and in addition to the multiple positions we've been down, um, uh, the last couple of days have, have been typical examples. We, we had seven people out yesterday and we had six people out today. So we are stretched so thin that that is Mr. McGaw and I covering classes, which, which we like to do, but is not, is not, is not all that easy. 
So to find spots for those 55 students, I, we need to, would need to think about space. I also, um, we use our gym every period of every day, and, and even before school and, and after school. So I also made the decision that I did not believe it was in the best interest of Auburn Middle School to carve up that space for regular classrooms, and then, then back to the other problem. If I did, I don't have the staff to cover it. So that is um, where, and I want to want, because it's been mentioned, I want to be, I want to be pretty up, up front, um, because I, I've been doing this, this long enough that I've learned to try to think multiple steps ahead. You know, um, so we're not always being reactive. So we, we, I and we have given some thought to, to what, if, what if it were three feet. Um, we, we could bring Auburn Middle School students back at, at three feet. There, there would, as um, um, Ms. McClellan had mentioned, there would be some challenges with that. For example, some work I did today would, and looking at it, would probably um, require us to have um, about seven, we believe seven lunches. We originally thought eight, but it'd be, it'd be seven. So, I mean, that would be roughly starting first lunch around, um, you know, around 9.30ish. Um, you know, so those, those are some of the challenges in addition to, you know, I think some things like transportation and, and stuff like that. But we are um, proposing in our plan to bring back um, 112 students five days a week um, to cohort A, 126 additional students can return into, um, into cohort B. Uh, the next page gives a breakdown of the actual teams. And um, Birch is what I talked about at the bottom was our fully remote team. Um, that's why that's is not applicable. And uh, at this point, for example, Miss Callahan is the team leader on Spruce. So, so maybe you could talk a little yeah. bit about what this would look like. So, like, like Spruce. With the reason why we have 21 seats on A is we've had some students who've decided to go fully remote, and because we're synchronous, synchronously teaching, I don't repeat lessons. I teach. And I expect to see the kids either on Zoom or in front of me every day. Well, five days a week. That's the most we give our <laughs> weekends off, right? Um, so 30, um, so but we have that 39% is a little higher than our B day because I've had some students who've chosen to be remote for health reasons. Um, they want to be near their grandparents. Um, and I'm finding that some of those switching as vaccinations are happening. But um, even with the returning on Wednesdays, I do have some parents who've opted not to let their kids come more than two days a week. So it really depends on the parent, and it depends um, on the family, and it, it needs to be ultimately their choice. I mean, obviously, I, I try to say I really need your kid here in front of me. It'd be so much, it's, it's a lot easier to, to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so what we did, uh, my team met for two hours last Wednesday. Um, to try, and some of this is after school time. I think you guys need to hear that, especially at the middle school, we don't have time to use a team like we normally did. And so the team teachers are using the after school time when we're not doing extra Zooms with kids to help get some of them caught up. Um, we're meeting together. So um, we have to be pretty inventive um, to keep our teaming and our team atmosphere. And um, I think that's been pretty much our, our whole challenge. I'm pretty impressed with my team that we were able to come up with a list and then an alternate list. But it wasn't easy to do. Um, and I know some of you are worried about the stigma. And that was a big, you know, we say, okay, so student X, we want to bring them back. Is that good for them? Are they going to feel like we're telling them that they're not good enough and they need extra help? Or is they going to take that in a bad way? Or is this student going to take this in a good way? I mean, I've had I have students who are honor roll students who are saying, when can I come back full time? I hate learning at home. I don't like being at home. And then they tell you about their homes. Just because a kid is, a, is an honor roll child doesn't mean they're not suffering in their home environment. So you really, I can't just say, I can't just look at our star scores. I have to look at everything when I'm looking at as a kid. So fortunately, I have 21 kids on A that we've got spaces for and 18. Now that changes daily. I have kids who may decide to go remote next week. Or, um, you know, I have a kid who's gone to Florida. Her family's decided to go to Florida next week. So then she has to quarantine. She's going to be gone. Can I fill in that space for a little bit? So these numbers continue to fluctuate and it's always a moving target for us, which um, I think causes us a lot of um, 
time to step back, reflect. If we were to have the three feet, we could bring such, you should know Mr. Mazzotti has done a lot of geometry, and um, he's, his high school geometry seems to come in play here about where we could actually fit kids in. Um, my, my question is about lunches. I mean, we still have to be six feet apart at lunches. These kids are sitting in the same seat all day long. Um, it's hard enough to keep them apart when they're six feet. I can't imagine three feet. We're talking about middle schoolers. You're talking teenagers, you know. Um, I think they're kind of the same as kindergartners sometimes when it comes to following directions. I've been doing this a while. I in middle school. I don't yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've been doing this a while. So, mm -hmm. um, and I love the age. So, just that I'm not, that's not meant as a, mm -hmm. as a thing. Um, so, um, I, I think we, we tried to really look at everything when we came up with that list. So, I wanted to speak to that because I know that's a worry. And the numbers, I'm hoping we could increase them with the three feet, but it doesn't increase that much with the three feet. Because of our spacing, no, it does. It does. It does. No, it we needed we needed desks. We have to wait till you order more desks. But I guess that's a Mr. Hansen issue. That's not enough. <laughs> um, so, so we do have. If we were to move to a three feet in the classroom, we can fit the all of the students. As you can see, we only need uh, about fifty-five more students in. But the the lunchroom piece. Sorry, the lunchroom piece is really the key, and uh, for us, that we can only fit someplace around 35 or 40 students in the lunchroom um, with the six foot spacing. And we are using our gymnasium at all times, we are using our um, library. And so, for us to be able to feed those students is literally going to take. Hours. And we have to have appropriate coverage for middle school kids. It isn't like high school kids, you can just send them into the cafeteria and let them eat. High school kids need, need a little more, super, uh, less supervision than middle school. So um, coverage is also an issue. Like you could have some in the cafeteria and have some on the team, but then we don't have enough teachers covering and the teachers also getting their duty free, you know, 20 minutes. So it's, it, it's a quite a conundrum as Mr. Maga and Mr. Uh, Griffin has found out in doing schedules. Uh, so uh, this plan would maintain um, the remote option for, for those who have chosen that. There would also be um, students who are there for two days a week, like cohort A, and two days a week, cohort B, and then there would be a group of students who were there um, who were there five days a week. And I, I, with confidence, can say, like Sue had talked about, the work her team has done, we will be ready, um, you know, depending on how this evening goes, to implement uh, this and get going right away and getting these, um, getting these students um, back. We, uh, all of us, uh, without exception, believe that um, in-person, face-to-face learning is, is best for our students. And the, the 291 number, does reflect 84.5% uh, of our students back. So it is the vast majority of our students back, um, uh, of the in-person students. So that's pretty exciting for us. Questions at this point? How many would you need So each, so it, um, This would be a five-day student. Yeah. So, so you can see um, each team would have individually those those numbers. I think there was a slide that uh, you had 112 students in cohort A, 126 students in cohort yeah. B. Yeah. I'm going to stay away so from the numbers tonight. So the, 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 the team one is, to me, it, it makes more sense in my mind because it isn't, some teams have different numbers mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you have kids who, like on my team, I have every kid takes social studies and science and I only have flow. Some other teams have flow for more than just, you know, just language arts and math. So it, it really gets kind of complicated in that. So I think it's better to look at per team. Um, I, I've just trained, our middle schools trained me to look at things. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Team Maple, for instance, Team Maple is a two teacher team. So that's why their percentages are still relatively similar to the other teams. Because with smaller numbers of students, because it's only two classes. Right. So, 
So I've, I have, um, we have four classrooms on our team. And um, so uh, t 21 students, 21 seats are available throughout. Like one classroom actually doesn't have any seats because there are 13 kids in that class. And then I have, and then we actually have two remote kids also. So, um, and then there's another one that I can bring back seven because a lot of kids have gone remote in that class. It's just the way it shifted out. So if they went five days a week, you would add the 17 to the 25, let's say time, or let's say they would be 20 kids in that coming back in that entire. I, I can go by spruce. I, so I have 21 kids I normally see. On Tuesday, Thursday, yeah. I have 21 kids now. I'm seeing on Monday, Tuesday, as well. It's not 21 and 18. Well, I'd, I'd be seeing 21 extra. Uh, the, those A students would now be coming on uh, 21 extra on Thursday and Friday, and 18 on Monday and Tuesday. So you would have for five days. Would you have uh, 39 kids? No, I have way more than that. Right, yeah. I have something like 72. I don't understand. This. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't understand this. So that's that's the title of that oh, we'd be more yeah. yes. okay. All right, I thought it was your total. That's why I'm. I'm no, I, like, I have 82 kids. I have 82 kids on my team. Okay, I might be down to 80 because I think two moved, but you know, okay. the numbers fluctuate daily. Okay, so you'd be having 21 more, more for A and for A, A and 18 more. So would, would you continue to have cohort A and cohort B? Okay, so you're still gonna you want to still for hybrid for contact and and full remote. So you're talking all three options. Okay. Now, now I, I do want to um, sort of clarify when I, I talked about. Um, it, and this was absolutely the right thing to do, I believe, to accommodate every parent request along the way. Our plan here is to fill almost every seat. Now, I want to leave a tiny number available for any move-ins that might happen. But what this, I, I believe, would necessitate would be us essentially needing to stop a lot of requests, you know, because we just are not going to have the, we're not going to have the, the flexibility, for example, if we have... Um, Ten students who are learning remotely who want to come back, we're not going to necessarily have the seats for that. So it does tighten that that up a little bit. But but I, I believe I mean we're we're approaching the fourth quarter. I believe it's it's completely completely workable. And again, as I said, the vast majority of our fully remote students are already connected to a team and their teachers. So I do not expect much movement at all from them. I was going to ask you that the fluidity of you know, giving everybody the permission to change, do this and do that, how will, you, how will that work if you're so tight for spots? Yep, and, and, and I, 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 with confidence, I can speak, we've been doing that all year. You know, we've, we, I've had to make sure there are equitable balances in teacher classrooms and team assignments and everything like that. So we've gotten very, very good at placing students and supporting them and making sure they're connected to the resources they need and everything like that. Again, what I would make sure we do is leave what would be a pretty small number of spots available, and those would really be for the move-ins we have into, the, in, in, into our district in these, these last few months. Any other questions for the middle school team? It's, it's actually a point, and, I, and it's for everybody. And I think because somebody just uh, made a really good point that I think we should, we should consider when we talk stigma, um, homelessness, dropping out, being incarcerated, and being forced to repeat a grade, there's a stigma attached to that too, mm -hmm. um, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, mm -hmm. That I think these okay. folks have done the best they can, I personally believe. Three feet is the way it's supposed to go. I personally believe. Do you, do you uh, have a question for them? I'm gonna make sure. No, you I, can there's no question. That. I'm gonna go off, but I just wanted to bring those points of stigma that. Okay, yes. answer that. Bring it back when we do conversation and, and debate. Any other questions for our middle school team? Um, have a question. So the kids that are coming in, you're talking about filling in every seat that you possibly can. Um, is that just the failing kids? Like not failing kids. I, I'm sorry. That's the struggling kids. So, so the I mean the the sort of the term we we've adopted is the the high support. So again, the, as Sue had mentioned, it might not be a child who's failing. I have an honor roll student. I will be asking 
to come in because I believe the home situation, it's better for her to be with me five days a week. I, I agree with you. I think yeah. that there are kids who are going to have yeah, I see your question. Right. I just, just to keep moving things moving, I want the questions and the conversation and debate leads to some of the motions. Okay. Any other questions for these folks? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the work that you have done and for answering our questions. All right, high school folks. Hello, welcome. Good evening. Thank you for having us. I am grateful <coughs> to be joined by Carrie Latrup, one of our esteemed English teachers and one of the co-chairs of the English department tonight. Uh, for us, um, we are. Our proposal is to be able to bring our cohorts A and B students back five days a week. Uh, the biggest question that we get asked often is, why now? This will provide the most access for the most students. Uh, the room capacity and enrollments allow for students from cohorts A and B to attend five days a week. As we've crunched numbers based on room capacities and enrollments, we're able to see that in the vast majority of classes, we would at this point in time be able to get our cohorts A and B in. 30 to 40 percent of our classes are quarter classes. Changing at the start of the fourth quarter prevents multiple changes for students. We already have some natural changes that are taking place, and in our proposed plan, we try to minimize the number of changes that they would have to do through the building. By having more access to students in the building, we will be better able to support the social and emotional well-being for person for in-person students. I've heard a lot of conversation tonight about the things that you can't see beyond a grade or a star score. All of our students need that support, and this allows us to provide as much support as we can five days a week uh, for the social emotional aspects of all of our students. And another really key important component for us that provides the most more access to seniors needing to complete their graduation requirements. And that's just not to say seniors who may be in a recovery situation, but they're enrolled in their classes now. It allows us to be able to finish with a strong flourish and give them at least some aspects of their senior experience, the very best that we can. How can this happen? Well, having crunched the numbers and looked at our room capacities that we've established back in uh, the fall, based at six feet spacing, some classes will change rooms for a period to accommodate their enrollments in a room with a larger room capacity. So if I have a room that has 14 and the room capacity is 12, and across the hall, I have a room capacity that's 20, and they have 12, we can swap places. Uh, there's not widespread numbers of those, and we'll talk about that soon. Students may be placed in an alternative classroom for that selected period to access their class remotely or work in a workshop model under supervision of a buddy teacher. Earlier this evening, you heard the elementary teachers talking about the, uh, the um, workshop model and how that allows for supportive differentiation and honing in on what the needs are for the students. This allows the teacher to identify that period which students would need to go to their remote site for that period uh, to access them. That may be group work or that may be zooming in or that may be independent work. We often have seen that in the past when we have a student that needed to review prior to taking a test while the rest of the students took a test. We often found alternative sites for that very much built on that premise. And we will still continue to work with students and families who are full remote to explore possibilities for increasing in-person learning. We have done, our, the assistant principals have done an incredible job at reaching out to families that are fully remote, who uh, the families have reached out to us to say they're struggling, their data indicates that they're struggling, and so we're trying to get any kind of piece of get them into the building if it's for one day or one period. We say over and over in our building, if I can just get you into the building, I can do something. And so it really, with the remote students, we're still going to continue on that path. Who is affected? So on the top, you see that we have cohort A is right now, we have 323 students in cohort A. In cohort B, we have 318. That is about 641 students that make up cohorts A and B. 
That was the number that we took to try to see what does that look like throughout the building. And right now we have 265 in cohort C. This number has been very volatile throughout the year. In the last month and a half, we've seen this stabilize to allow us to make the best assumption, which is a scary word, but the best assumption about how stable can that number be. When we did the math and looked at the numbers in the room capacities, we have 75 total students out of that 641 will need to be relocated to a buddy teacher depending on attendance of class each day. So if you had a class that had a capacity of 14 and you had 16 enrolled, there's a possibility that two students may be absent and so no change would need to happen that day. Maybe everyone is there and then those two students that get identified by the teacher based on what we talked about earlier that some of that workshop model, some of that independent model would be sent to their buddy teacher class. Overall, we have 27 classrooms that would be impacted. If we look at 70 teachers approximately teaching about four periods straight a day, that's about 280 classes that happen every single day. That would be 27 of the classrooms that would be impacted. The majority of these classrooms will only move about one to three students uh, to their buddy teacher. What does this look like? The picture on the left is a classroom from this morning. It's the math classroom that had about 10 students enrolled with a capacity of uh, 14. Across the hall, and that's cohort B on the left, just cohort B students. Across the hall, we had a cohort B and C combined class taking place. So you could see that there are some additional spaces in there. The teacher was instructing the person that was there. They had two absent plus their cohort C students simultaneously. So if we had overflow from the picture on the left, they could be across the hall accessing their class uh, from the classroom on the right. The other advantage of this being in proximity is if we're talking about the whole day, the student would still have access to that teacher during their flex time at the end of the day if they weren't in readily directly available to them during that period. And we'll continue to implement all of our safety measures that we have up to this point and have been very successful for us. Uh, six foot spacing is what we've worked on from the beginning of the school year. One way traffic will continue. Hand sanitizing, mask wearing, sanitizing of surfaces, nightly cleanings of classrooms, the lunch protocols of keeping students six feet apart. We'll come back to that question. We do utilize the cafeteria for a program down there. However, very similar to what the middle school described, and, and we do have supervision, a, a tremendous amount of supervision for lunch. Uh, we would be starting at about 9 o'clock in the morning and running all the way until 2.10 if we were to try to do that based on uh, the six-foot distancing that we still have in place for eating. Right now, they eat in the classroom, which is why we continue to use that six-foot mark within the classrooms, because that's where they are eating. And we continue to use our QR code to assist us and uh, instead of getting a paper pass, they now scan in and out so we can track them for contact tracing purposes if they were to go to the bathroom, go to guidance, go to the nurse. So we know approximately how long in their path so that we can find them on the camera. We need to identify if they were in contact with someone for 15 minutes. As well as we will continue to follow all DOE and COVID guidelines that have been set forth in the framework and apply them as we have all year long. Questions for our high school? Ahead, Brian. Quick question, Mr. Commissioner of Lunch Period. What, what is a school lunch period now? So, right now, uh, lunch begins at 12.05 and runs till 12.35. It happens within their classroom. Uh, they have 30 minutes. Um, in this model, because uh, we have a 30 minute duty free lunch period for the teachers. That's why it's built that way. We create supervision, uh, being creative with staff and ed techs to supervise hallways. Uh, so they, we're patrolling admin uh, free bodies that aren't doing that, and we kind of scaffold in that lunch process. In a typical year, it would be about 20 minutes in the cafeteria, five for travel down, five for travel back. Our, our in-between travel times have remained the same of five minutes. Thank you. Go ahead, Adam. So I've heard... Um, 
talk circulating around the school, and I'm sorry if I missed this during the presentation, but um, the students that are being allowed back, is it similar to the elementary program, like the struggling students, or is it just anybody? We're taking all A and B. So all, all of the A students and all of the B students would be there five days a week. Any questions? Yeah. I have a question. So you said that 75 students would be affected by the overcapacity and have to go to a budding teacher. Does that mean every, like, how is that broken down by class? Is that per day 75 students, or is that per period 75 students? Higher four-period schedule all the way through. If we were to bring... All 641 kids, 75 through the four periods. If everyone was there, all 641 that day, which I would love to see, um, then we would be identifying 75 students. The teachers would be period by period. It breaks down to, I think, first period we had 14, second period there's 23 and 27. It gets, I had it all written out and I left it on my desk, but it breaks out each period. Uh, like I said, the first period, I think there's either 11 or 14 students uh, that would have to go to a buddy teacher from their classroom. And, and it's not first come, first serve. You know, if you're late to class, you're automatically that person picked. It's very much the teacher voice on who they identify can be most independent that day. Also, um, so of all those, you have a, a buddy teacher near that class that can accommodate. As close as we can, can, absolutely. Okay, and also, if you have, you are in a class where you need to keep speaking to the Zoom and to the teacher and stuff, how, how is that not disruptive to the other class if they're in a class that's already being taught? Yeah, um, the majority of the classrooms that we have, the majority of spaces we have identified were classrooms that were either a recovery period or they were ones that were doing a remote class already so that it would make minimal disruption. And we're talking about, like I said, on average, one to three students um, have already put in for, I don't want to beat up Mr. Hansen, but we've already requested about 700 sets of headphones, earbuds, whatever, so to try to minimize that noise so that they would be in a location that the receiving teacher would be able to identify in the back of the room. And it would be very much a model that we've seen in a learning lab where you have multiple students doing things so it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be involved with their receiving teacher's instruction, and we will work as hard as we can to try to make sure that there isn't a disruption. Um, in terms of speaking, there's still, if we're doing Zoom, there's still the opportunity to be able to, to type in questions. It's not the perfect answer. None of this is a perfect answer, but it does a lot. Technology allows us for this, that the student and the teacher to still be able to communicate, and when there are those times, I'm, I'm sure that the classrooms can make arrangements for speaking back and forth with the Zoom. But uh, having the ear, ear headphones or whatever the, the tool is, we, we're going to order enough so that everyone would have their set so we, that wouldn't become a barrier to why they could access their class somewhere else in the building. But now the, bed, the buddy class itself, will that be all kids that need to are no, over no. or would it be like a math class that's being taught and I have a science class and I'm, I'm it could be capacity and... It, it, I'm talking to that teacher and they're teaching over here? Could be, or it may not be. There, there may not be, um, a, a, for many of those classes, they were classes that were already identified as a remote classroom. Not all of them, but many of them have been identified. So the teacher is teaching remotely for those other 265 students. So it allows them to, to not be distracted by the instruction that's going on. And now, how will the, um, as we actually going back to the teacher from um, AMS, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, um, we talked about uh, social, emotional, mental health. You can have a student that is, um, and this is a question, you have a student that is, um, you know, attending all Zooms, is getting great grades, but is contemplating suicide. How do you know that? Like, how are you going to assess that, and how will being in school help that student? I can speak to that a little bit. I think uh, when you have students in person, you know, say the class wraps up, you wrap up your instruction five minutes early or something, and that's, those are those moments that you connect with kids, and you have those chats and those check-ins, hey, how are you doing? Um, whereas if the, if the student's on the Zoom, they turn off 
you know, as soon as the class is over and you don't get those check-ins. So I think that it will, the more kids are in school, the more you notice, the more you have the chance to make those connections where you see those things. And very similar in the fashion that we always have is that teachers recognize that, families communicate that, their friends are their best advocates to let us know if a crisis situation is developing. We utilize all of our resources and teams, whether it's guidance counselors, social workers, the administrators, uh, the teachers are the greatest source, and, and being around their friends who will recognize and that they've communicated with, those are all indicators, as well as the families reach out to us. So we've, we've always utilized those strategies. Are they perfect? Are they guaranteed? No, but those are the ones that we've done before, and having more access to those students allows for those opportunities to try to identify um, those struggles that may not be as visible as we would like to, that, that we were talking about. I just have one more question. Sorry, go ahead. And that's about the ventilation system. This is an issue I had in the beginning of the year, too. Um, and it was also brought up by a community member as well. Um, the ventilation system, is, can it um, accommodate having everybody in? Yeah, so when we go all the way back to August and September when, when that conversation came up, when, when the air circulation uh, pneumatic specialists, <laughs> I remember I brushed up on those notes, came in, they based that on uh, having everybody in the building. And so at this point in time, we're talking about that 641. And so the, the air circulation hasn't changed. It's continued to operate at its full capacity 24 hours a day, seven days a week instead of just during school hours. Uh, we continue to provide all the maintenance all the way through as much as we possibly can. Fuses blow, we, we upgrade them, we put them in, we take care of that. Not my field of expertise. My job is to make sure that it keeps running. Uh, those things have happened. And the other place that is a, is a good consideration, it wasn't what led us to this place, but a good consideration, is that we're moving, our, we're moving into the warmer temperatures so it allows for more windows to be open, and, and we've had two fans in every single classroom venting air out as an enhancement, as another strategy to try to keep the air circulation going. Um, all those things together put us on par with the air circulation in the other buildings. And now, I know that we did the cohort with the whole contact tracing. That was one of the, the biggest um, reasons we did cohorts. Um, if how is that going to work now if we do have a, a small outbreak or if there's a teacher and the kids have to quarantine? Does the whole school have to shut down? Because before we have had incidences where we've shut down an entire cohort and we've maintained the other ones to keep going. How is that going to work if we have all the kids? It would, it would work very similar, except instead of having two distinct cohorts, we'd have an expanded cohort. So if um, a student was exposed in a classroom, um, by another student, um, then it, that classroom itself becomes the cohort and not, not a hybrid A or a hybrid B. That entire classroom becomes the cohort. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming and all your hard work on this. Thank you. Thank you. More slides for you on transportation. Yeah. So certainly this has been one of the, the areas that, um, oh yeah, what about transportation? Very critical, very important. Uh, so I know that in our, our um, steering committee, this, there's a group that meets while the different grade le um, levels are meeting. Uh, the support services staff is also meeting, Adam is in that group as well, and spent some time in the last couple of meetings talking about this, but pulling this together today. So, Adam, do you want to go over? Sure. The, go through the bullet points, which pretty much sum up the, the transportation situation. So, as we've discussed, the, we've been able to limit the capacity to one student per seat on our buses this year, and with the exception of siblings, who are allowed to sit together. Uh, once the once the students are identified, transportation is, is ready <laughs> right now to start working out the detailed plan of what that's going to look like on each bus. Because obviously it comes into play, okay, then that student, okay, does that student ride the bus? 
I said, no, we don't have to worry about them. Like, you know, so each situation is unique. So they'll start working those. But just from preliminary, some preliminary work that Billy and Sheila have done, we believe we can keep most, if not all, of the funds to the one student per seat by either shifting a few students to another run or doubling up on some of the short runs. Some of the in-town runs, which happen to be the ones with the most kids on the buses, it's easy to, enough to double those up if we have to. And uh, even in the coldest of weather, we've kept some of the windows cracked open on the buses for ventilation. And as the warm weather is coming in, more and more of those windows are going to be opened up. So that's going to be another point in our favor. So we feel that the transportation will be able to accommodate the plans that have been brought forth tonight. Um, when you say double run, that was just for um, clarity for that might mean I do a run, I drop the kiddos off, I gotta go get another group of kiddos and I will be dropping them off fifteen, twenty minutes later than the, the original group. So it's like almost like a staggered end of school. That's exactly right, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any questions about transportation? So like lunches which was discussed earlier, having to start at nine thirty because you have to accommodate space. Are these bus runs going to be super early for um, the earlier kids or later? Or is everybody going to get to school on time? And how is that going to look to get the kids to school on time? So that I don't step out of my area where I know what I'm talking about. If Mr. Hunter is out there and would like to come in and address that question. Oh, Those are all the <laughs> questions, Cam, that we were asking as well in Billy's village. So will they get to school on time? Uh, the plan is yes. Uh, if we do have to double up on a run, like uh, Adam mentioned, uh, we do have some buses that arrive to some of the schools early. Some of the bus runs are short, so they get there uh, earlier than the bus runs, for instance, at North Auburn or whatever. So if we did have to go pick up some other kids, uh, we try to use those early run buses to go pick up the other kids and get them to school on time as best we can. Any other questions about transportation? Theoretically, there could be absolutely no change in the North Kids Union School on the school bus because we don't know the data. If there's an open invitation going out, they might all say, no, nah, I'm good right now. That's a great point. Uh, so we don't know the data. When you get the data, then you'll probably be able to answer any of our questions. We go by what we have currently, uh, which is ever changing. <laughs> but. Uh, with what we have to work with uh, and going with the experience that we have uh, from past years, even though this is a different year, um, we think we can handle most of that. Any other questions regarding transportation? I would only add it would be another area, when, since three feet has come into the conversation, it would be another area that would need to be reviewed and, and looked at. And that, at that point, we probably would need to look at the guidance again in, um, in transportation and what we used as a standard would, would likely change. Thank you. Thank you all. Is there anything left on the reentry steering committee? Not just that. I think Mr. Amir's quote tonight, not a perfect answer. Um, there's one perfect answer, and we're working toward that. And that is getting all of our students back in um, full time. Uh, that's really what the steering committee is working toward. Eventually, as we keep moving this um, and responding to this ever changing um, criteria, that particularly in, in March has been an interesting thing to, to respond to. So, just wanted to, to, to remind us of that, that we understand that there are some things that are less than what we like them to be, um, but that we're moving toward that. And, and I do believe, as you can, I think you'll agree with me, that it's been a very thoughtful process that the educators that have. Um, been involved, uh, have, have entered into, and been very open-minded in trying to address the needs of the students. That's been, a, that's been a lot of work that's been done, so thank you for all that work um, to every member of the steering committee. I just have one question. So, um, the steering committee has, is comprised of all stakeholders. Um, my question is, how many or what is the percentage of the entire committee that is for this plan, and how many are not? So this has been a consensus process. This hasn't been a voting process. This has been a consensus process. So we work to consensus. And that's why we've had several meetings to come to consensus about this. So there's not a vote. 
answer your question, but it's not a vote. It's to continue to work the plan until there's a plan that we can recommend. So everyone, no one has said that they're not in favor of the plan here who is on the steering committee. So is your plan that basically what you had recommended, you wanted more in-person, so that was the goal, and how do you make that work? Is that what the steering committee was working on? Yes. So we as a committee, I think, have been very vocal from the beginning that we want to maximize and continuously make sure that we are maximizing in-person learning, that we are responding to the criteria and the situations that are in front of us every couple of months. And so I think that's been the goal, and so I'll have that as your very first slide, is to maximize that in-person learning. And I really appreciated Mr. Griffin. Mr. Griffin said how he would like to plan ahead, and he actually checked his school to see if he could have grade C. I appreciate that, because I'm that kind of person that likes to look three steps ahead, what is going to happen. And I guess my question is, as you stated, that things are changing, things are in flux, they're talking about three C, six C. So as a re-entry committee, why have we not looked at what that could look like? We have. Procedures. Procedures. When you hear what Mr. Griffin said, all of the principals have done that same exercise. Okay. Measured and measured and measured. Starting back in August, actually. And as different fluctuations in remote, as you heard Mr. Griffin say, looking at that again. So that's going to continue. Thank you. Any other questions for Michelle? Would you like to have a presentation? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
the DOE came out with some very sort of graduation specific guidelines. And then after Friday the 5th, when the governor changed some, some of the capacity orders, they pulled them back. So some of us did some investigating to go pull and, and find those old DOE ones two days older uh, as a model of what we can do. So we are very much being mindful of what does uh, capacity look like and what, are those, what will those restrictions be. There will still be some things that will need to be in place. And so we're partnering up with Lewiston very, very much um, in terms of sharing resources and sharing planning strategies uh, for the fifth. And so we are moving in that direction very much to be at the airport. Um, the other schools are still trying to solidify their decisions, but Lewis and EL are, are really continuing to move on that path. Um, we, the logistics are still coming out. We're still trying to figure out where some of those outdoor capacities. And so if for us, our $50,000 question is, what does outdoor capacity mean? Uh, so we're trying to get some definitions. Uh, I've been in conversation with Mark Goslin from the city to talk about some of their resources, as well as Matt Fightfield, um, to try to get some understanding of what indoor capacities and outdoor capacities look like. And that, that's going to become very beneficial for us for spring sports, as well as for any of our outdoor events that we have going on. From, from, from the airport standpoint, uh, last year it wasn't a concern for the airport because we were closed down during that time period. There is a concern with us because as an open airport, we have to run everything by the FAA. So that's why we, the plans were to try to solidify as quickly as possible because as I said, they're, they're looking at five schools, so that is a lot of the day that the airport would be non-functioning. So that's why a lot of this was up in the air is because we were getting some feedback from the FAA as to what would be done and, and fees and things like that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Thank you. All right. Uh, school Committee chair, Chairperson Support. Um, I just want to thank the uh, members of the School Committee for joining the Urban Schools Department uh, and myself at the joint uh, meeting of the City Council um, and School Department meeting the other night. Um, and just a thank you to We've heard from a lot of community members, um, staff members. They've reached out to the school committee over these last few weeks. So we do appreciate hearing from you. And uh, we're grateful that you've taken the time to share your thoughts and opinions with us around the reentry committee. And city council update, Mr. Carrier. I may have just touched on it a little bit there. Well, I mean, we were, for the most part, everybody was here there at the meeting the other mm -hmm. night. Uh, and, and I personally like having that meeting mm -hmm. and having everybody presence so that there's an understanding not only of what goes on in the school committee but also what goes on from the council side of it uh, and sharing the, the fact that it's not people understand that it's not just the school committee that's making uh, sacrifices uh, looking very hard at the budget uh, part of that was the fact that the, you know, they, they shared the fact that the city budget they had to look at very seriously about staffing and things to make sure that we're going to make the budget this year and how we're going to do it. So I think that the more things that we do together, uh, only benefits us all. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, school committee, uh, sorry, committee reports. You have the um, corn reported on the curriculum subcommittee the evening of March 3rd. So the meeting was on March 3rd. Um, she reported on it March 3rd. And we have the minutes for the curriculum subcommittee. Uh, building committee, you were done. We've approved the that one. You have the entire PDF that the building committee um, was given and shown, as, as well as the design and the, and the funding budget for that. So, any questions on any of that? We've already done it before. So, we're just going. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll on it. I tried. Yeah, I tried. Yeah. Um, any other? Committees that need to report out right now. Yeah, Mr. Simpson. I did. It's not a report, but I was trying to get in before you went to Dr. Brown. Oh, it's, sorry. It's no, no, no. It's fine. It's it's to build off what Abigail shared. Um, I was hoping to see Will tonight, um, and I think oh. it's important we recognize Will that he was nominated for the Travis Roy Award, which is the highest um, esteemed uh, recognition in the state of Maine for hockey players. Um, you know, if if you'll Stay with me for a second. Congratulations to the EL boys swim team and the girls. They came in second and third in, at the Cave Axe. 
Last week, for the boys, it's the highest they've ever done. Absolutely. And a uh, shout-out to Andrew Caceres, a sophomore at Yale, who he didn't break the school record. He destroyed it, <laughs> he, which is, I mean, it was an amazing thing. And I think if it's, if it's safe to invite these kids in so we can acknowledge them and their accomplishments appropriately. Work. In the Absolutely. future. Thank you very much for letting me do that. Thank you. Um, I do have to report, and I, I'm sorry, I should have said this earlier during that time. Um, unfortunately, we um, have lost Will Cassidy as a student rep uh, when he applied as a student rep. It was as though we were in yellow. Winter sports were not looking like they were going to be happening. Hockey, um, his hockey schedule took over, and now we've got spring sports are a go. And Will is a baseball player, and so. His schedule. There was a lot. Um, I would say the email was quite in depth as to why he needed um, to resign as a, as a school committee rep. But he's very much looking forward to doing it. But unfortunately, his court schedule just did not allow him to do that. Um, speaking of recognition, too, I just wanted to, to also touch on um, the great turnout that we had on Saturday for the vaccination of educators and school staff, 55 and older and, and above. Um, St. Mary's did a, um, a great clinic over at Connors Elementary School in Lewiston. Um, and so they would have loved to be able to vaccinate everybody, but unfortunately they, were only, they only received a certain amount of vaccines, so they had to, to go with the age constraints. But um, there was a great turnout, and it was wonderful to see staff members from all over in Scotland County coming and getting their vaccination. Do you know if they're going to be scheduling another one? They are going to be scheduling another one because it was the Moderna vaccine, which is a two-part vaccine. Um, but they weren't sure yet where they were going to have the space to do that. So they were going to, the, um, everyone's respective administrator is going to be notified of when the next clinic is, and um, they will tell them. And we'll continue there, and hopefully I'll volunteer them too. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for both of those things. All right, so at this point, can I entertain a motion to accept the finance report for February 2021 as presented, please? So, Okay. Okay. So, uh, all right. Let's carry over here. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? Uh, motion passes. Thank you. All right. Old business. We are moving on to a few policies. Policy AC, which is pol uh, policy AC non discrimination, equal opportunity, and affirmative action. Can I entertain a motion to approve policy AC, please? So Thank you. And a second. Oh, sorry, Dan. Sorry, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Yes, in favor. Uh, any questions, comments? Seeing none. All those in favor? Uh, motion passes. Thank you. All right. Moving now into the. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with it. All right. The. No, I won't do that. Okay. So moving into the uh, re entry recommendations. So I am going to say that in hearing everything that was kind of discussed tonight, it sounded like three very different distinct um, plans that were happening. So I, I would like to entertain a motion to separate the recommendations from the reentry committee into three separate motions. One for the high school, one for the middle school, and one for pre-K six. Anyone like to move that motion for me? Second. Second. All right, so I heard Pam over here. I heard Mr. Uh, Belknap over here. Okay, so the motion is on the table. So we can um, questions, comments about breaking those three apart. All right, all in favor for breaking those three apart. Motion passes, none opposed. All right, so uh, let's start. Let's start with EO first. Can I entertain a motion to approve the recommendations of the reentry committee for a full five-day return? for Edward Little High School. So moved. Thank you, Faith. Can I have a second? Oh, is there it over there? Second. I am sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at this point, public comments on the EL reentry. Would anyone like to come in and speak to public comments? I don't know who is in the community room who might like to come and speak on public public comments for the reentry on EL five days. Still in there? Is there anyone here for anything else? Sure, Abby, go ahead. Um, so I wrote down a few things before coming here. Um, I asked a few students, or I did a public 
from mm -hmm. the survey over social media. Um, yep. I wanted just to provide information for both sides, obviously, to cover both. Um, so for the yes, um, just the points of um, making the education better and more available. I know that's everyone's main goal here for the school committee. Um, more productive, better mental health for students. Um, but some of the student comments that were leaning towards yes was um, to benefit the seniors. Obviously, there's parents who have seniors in the room tonight, and they want their um, senior experience to return back to normal. Um, too many distractions at home for remote students is one of the concerns. Um, COVID was not spreading as much within schools because of the younger generation. We have more of a tolerance, I guess. Um, and then circling back to what Laura Garcia said a month or so ago about the students that are in um, unstable households will benefit from returning to school more often. Um, and then going to the no side of this topic, um, I wanted to comment and say that Lewiston did vote on this this past week and they said no to their proposal. So I just wanted to put that out there because we are neighboring and there was that one point where we wanted to merge into one. So just considering the fact that if they said no and we're going to say yes, it just seems a little conflicting. Um, one of the other questions was how would contact tra tracing be handled, which was answered, so thank you. Um, and then student comments was they have finally adjusted to the schedule and they um, said abandoning it now would disrupt everything that they've been working towards with adjustments. Um, and then main concerns are students aren't vaccinated yet and not all of these students are vaccinated, so it feels a little unsafe. So just commenting on both sides. So. Yeah. All right, so let's open it up now to um, comments, and I think, thinking about the high school, um, I think the easiest way to sort of be thinking about this is to just kind of flip around. Do you have anything you'd like to add um, to, to the comments or to the discussion? Uh, I think that might be just give everybody some air and some space. So it's one of these, like, speak once, what are you thinking? Um, and then kind of give that, give that little make sense? Does anyone want to open up the conversation? Go ahead. Ready? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Scott's done, Scott and his staff have done a great job. Um, you know, I think, you know, getting all the kids back to school has been our priority from day one. It should be our priority to go looking even forward. Um, you know, I think he, you know, they've done, a, they've looked at all the, you know, the requirements, they're fitting the requirements, they're looking at, you know, again, how safe it can be. Um, you know, I'm glad that you know they're able to bring everybody back into it in a way that makes sense. Um, because now, again, we, we, we capture the you know the freshmen that we were talking about a few weeks ago that were failing. We capture you know, um, you know it gives the seniors an opportunity. Uh, but again, I think I think this is a great proposal. I think they did you know it's well rounded and they you know I think they you know definitely support it. So. Thank you. Are you ready? Yeah. I, um, I, I agree. I think they did a wonderful job. I think they um, really looked at all the aspects of what was going to entail. Um, I commend the staff at Yale for really being versatile and um, really thinking outside the box. And all the work that you know, all the staff in Auburn has done throughout all of this pandemic. But um, you know, they kept the, the past week and a half. They've been really working on how this will work and they've really done a great job. Um, and I also, I really like the idea of having all the kids come back and not just some kids come back. Um, I know we differ on our ideas of stigmatization and equitability, but um, I do appreciate the fact that they're all going back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carey? Uh, I'll, I'll sort of parent everybody else's. I, I like the fact that, that we've looked at this and, and and come to the conclusion that, you know, this is what we can do going forward, you know, hindsight, foresight, you know, if we would have known that then what we know now. Uh, but I think it's a testament to the staff that they figured out going forward what we can do and are trying to get all the kids back in. Yeah, I definitely think the out school plan is 
Yeah. It's very, you know, all the students. That's, that's kind of, I think that's the difference. I think that's what we need to do. I, um, Abigail, thank you for sharing what you did. That's helpful. It's helpful information to know, like, the, you know, the moment in time, what the kids are feeling and thinking. So I appreciate you collecting that and sharing it with us. Um, I like what Bob Griffin said. He likes to plan ahead. He's not thinking about, he's thinking about next week and what's going to happen next week. Because I, I think we all, if we follow the news, the CDC is going to change it to three feet. What is that? It's going to happen. It's, I mean, it's, and I know we, I, and people in this community have been very judgmental of me. They don't know me. I'm about kids. I want these kids to get educated. That's, I, that's all I care about. And what happens when next week, next Monday, when they say three feet, and we vote to say a small piece of it? Because I heard the elementary and Bob say at three feet we could do this. We could bring them all back. Um, I, I, I dreaded this meeting all night because I, I have strong feelings about <clears throat> the cost that some of our kids have paid. That, and I was talking to Michelle before this meeting that, you know, when you look at the big picture of things, what has changed since August? The CDC guidelines haven't changed. The DOE guidelines haven't changed. In fact, what has changed is our positivity rate is probably four times that of August. So. You know, I respect lessons learned, okay, that we, we've learned how to manage these things. I, and I say this in the interest of every kid in Auburn, Maine, they need to all come back to school. And I would almost say table, table a vote until it gives the CDC. I just read three articles that Fauci and Jill Biden are engaging with this. So it's like, this is my thought. I appreciate the work people have done. This has been a very frustrating year. Um, for parents, for kids, for teachers, for administrators, and everybody's, everybody at the end of the day should feel good about their efforts, I believe. Um, and completely off talking, I've got to do this. That's the EL Boys KBAC uh, Nordic Team 1 1. Big champions, too. And Ellis <laughs> Dover and Ben Condon came in 1 2. We've got to do that because that's yeah. ultimately their. This is why I'm, I'm here. I think it's why we're all here. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I can agree to Dave more. I mean, everybody knows from day one that my priority is getting kids back in school. And like Dave said, those CDC guidelines are, you know, we've done plan after plan. And I know the steering the entry committee has worked tirelessly and have made the best decisions they could. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this plan because it gets all the high school students back in school. But if it were up to me, all kids would come back to school. Right. So, why we separated out the Right. We need to look at each at each one. Um, so I, I would just, um, add, I would echo everything that you have all said. Um, people have been working tirelessly and hard, and to community members who are screaming that people need to get back to work five days a week. Um, well, they are working five days a week, um, more than I've ever seen in all of my years of education. Uh, so I think this is a step in the right direction. To your point, Mr. Simpson, um, I'm a, um, I'm not a jump all in kind of person. I am a, you know, if we are inviting this many kids back now, uh, and, and thinking just about the high school, we're inviting this many kids back now, um, and maybe with 3D, people want to come back, who have been remote, might want to come back as well. And so I think that, um, I think the high school has, has um, a good, um, it's heading in the right direction. So with that being said, if everyone has kind of said a little bit of their piece, I'm going to call for a vote at this time. So all those in favor um, of a, uh, of the recommendation for the, from the reentry committee for a full five day return. Uh, for Edwards Little High School, all those in favor? Seeing none opposed, that motion passes. Edward Little to return, uh, I believe, April 5th, Michelle? All right, April 5th, full five day return. Um, just know that if you've got April 5th, full five day return, and there's some big changes going on by so far as where these kids are going to be able to.
park where staff is going to mm-hmm. park. We've got construction trucks coming in. So perfect, beautiful storm about to happen there. And I am so, I am so sorry. Yes, I, I, am, I am so sorry um, that this is colliding all together. Um, it just adds. It just adds to do more of what needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, it just it needs to add uh, more of what needs to be done. All right, so oh. can I just say one thing? I just want to put you back on what um, the system has been saying about the athletes, all these amazing um, athletes. But um, I then won the Travis Petroli Award, which is phenomenal. But also Caroline Tracy, who's also a senior, is a finalist in the Becky Schaefer Hockey Award, which is an equivalent to that award for women. So I just wanted to put that out there too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think this is important right now um, because it, it's, it's about kids, right? It's kid-centered. It's, it's about kids. That's why we're here. If you read your code of ethics, um, B talks about, I will at all times think of children first and make my decisions on how they will affect their education and their training. So this is children first. So. All right. Next one. Let's, let's go on to the middle school. Can I obtain a motion to approve the recommendations of the reentry committee as they apply to Auburn Middle School? Listen, I know we can't have a conversation. We can't have anything about it until we get a motion on the table. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'll take uh, Brian Belknap and Pam. Any, no, any public comments about the middle school? There's no one in there, I don't believe. All right, seeing none, let's bring it to School committee for discussion. So, same thing, let's open it up to conversation about the middle school and their reentry plan. Just a point of clarity um, remote is still remote, hybrid, and it, it's, those three options are still status quo. So, with invitations to return to. Right, so okay. the remote is kids are, it's the idea that those kids will probably still stay remote. We're entering into the fourth quarter, those kids will probably still stay remote. So then you've got the hybrid, but some of the kids from hybrid will be invited back five days. So all three options will be there. Any other comments? Um, I would, I have to say, I'm very, very impressed with Mr. Griffin and um, his, his staff. Um, I greatly appreciate the, um, the fact that he really has put a concentrated effort on the social emotional learning um, and the mental health. You know, I've talked about this before. You know, we all have been talking about mental health, and um, but I do think it's, it's, it's really important, and especially in this um, demographic. Um, we all know middle school is not an easy time for anybody, um, and so I really, um, I kind of wish we could bring all the kids back, but I do appreciate the fact, as Mr. Simpson said, there's the hybrid plan, there's the um, full-time, and there's the full remote, so you're kind of still... Um, able to catch all the kids. So I, I just want to say that I really appreciated his presentation. I thought it was, it was really thorough and very good. And then, uh, Mr. Carrier? I, I guess I'd like to see, uh, I'm sort of like Faith, I'd like to see a full return. And I think that the people that are currently, and I think it was said that it was 251, There were people that were remote. I think that uh, if the need be and if the you know, desire is there by the parents and the students, that they accept back as many kids as that they possibly can with whatever utilization of space that we have to have. If that means utilizing the cafeteria and gymnasium for something other than that, then I think that we ought to do it. I think that, you know, for the people that want to be back, that they need to have the availability to come back. Also, Mr. Simpson said, there is a lot of moving parts right now with the CDC and um, the three feet and the six feet rule. And um, as he said, last, next week, it could change. Um, so I know, I do feel like if, if there is a potential that we can get them all in, if, and if it's safe and the studies have shown that three feet is equal to six feet, then it's a wonder. I think this, for me, this is almost like another stepping stone towards full return, towards everyone towards full return. It's an opportunity to see what that looks like. It's an opportunity to see as an educator um, 
just increasing class sizes again. So for me, it's a stepping stone because the ultimate goal, and I said this, I've been very, very transparent about this, is that we're back five days. This gives us an opportunity to figure out what we're going to need to open these schools five days for everyone. So that's sort of my piece in thinking, why not all right now? I just had a follow-up question. Dr. Brown, I guess, and I don't know if it was during the discussion tonight or whether I heard it before, that there was a shortage of teachers at AMS. Staff, that they spread the kids apart so that they can teach. Is that more because people are calling out, or is it the fact that it's just people don't have the capacity? So I think it's about IPS, assistant teacher. It's the combination of both. And so when you have positions that are can't fill, and I think I kept the committee updated on where we stay to the city, and then that's exacerbated by teachers not being able to come in soon because they have been identified as a close contact. So the senior two in a place like the middle school can impact a fairly large group quickly with those contractions. So it's both things. Did we, and I guess the question begs itself, are we still having the same problem of not having an available amount of subs? I guess it's going to be. Statewide, nationwide. There are no subs. There are none. No. Would anyone else like to comment on the middle school? So the middle school is going to do the hybrid and remote and full-time, all three? Yes. So some kids will be invited back five days. Like that's what this committee will ask for. Some will stay hybrid and some will stay fully remote. So we're talking about the middle school. And the last question is, are you bringing more kids in? Is that going to create a bigger storm of more quarantine and more kids sick? So I think it's important not to mix anonymous sickness and sickness because we do have kids that go into quarantine who never become sick. So we do, by increasing the cohort size, there is a possibility that we will increase the number of students who are quarantined as part of that contact tracing. And so then they will move to remote learning while they're in quarantine. That's correct. Okay. Any other comments about the middle school? All right. Seeing none, let's take a vote, please. All those in favor of approving the recommendations of the Advisory Committee as they apply to Auburn Middle School. All those in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion passes. All right. Last but not least, can I entertain a motion to approve the recommendations of the Advisory Committee as they apply to grades pre-K, right? Is this correct, Michelle, pre-K? Pre-K through 6. Okay. Can I entertain a motion, please? So moved. I heard a lot. Jim Sicari over here. Sam, was that you over here? Okay. Can I have a second? All right. Any public comments on the elementary school? But I want to make sure I say it. No. Thank you, Dr. Doris. All right. Let's bring it back to the school committee for discussion on this point. Any questions or comments at this point? I'll just go first. Again, I'm going to side with wanting to get the students back. I have a problem, and I know that we said that there's, you know, they work together to make sure that there's no stigmatization to the kids and stuff. I just, you know, I don't see that fully coming through. If that were the case, then we wouldn't be seeing issues coming forward into the middle school or the high school. So we know that they still exist. And I just think doing it this way will add something there that doesn't have to be. So in all honesty, I would be more inclined to want to see a return to the elementary. Anyone else? Comments? Yes. 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 This is the hardest one for me to reconcile just because I think I believe, and this is the vote. I think they can bring them all. I think all these kids can come back. And what resonates for me is that number that in January was 25 percent, and today it could be 30 or 35 percent. And I think that, you know, I'm not an educator, but I think K through 6 is where kids learn their foundational skills. 
they don't get those in middle and high school. And we, I wish that we could have done this in January. Um, and it's really, really difficult because I do think they, I do think we can, we can, I think they need it almost more than the seniors. I really do. But that's just me. And, and the, the other thing, and, and it, that throughout this process, when I opened my notebook today, I opened on August 19th. And notes I took, and, and, and it brought me back. And you know, for for this is this is a polarizing topic in our community, and it has been. And a lot of people disagree with with me, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to model, not only for the kids, but I mean, if we could get a national platform to show people it's okay to disagree, and um, without you know going for the jugular, so to speak. So I I think. If I were to vote in favor of this tonight, I'm going to answer, I'll probably text you in the next three days when they change it to bring them back when they change it. Because I do believe it's really, really important for these kids that um, utilize the last eight weeks of school to, to pick up as much as they can. Thank you. So I'm going to piggyback on what you said. I have been asked the question, why now? Why now with only the, with, with what we have left of time? And I pushed back on that and said, why not now? Uh, if we can double the amount of time that some of these kiddos, I believe every moment in front of your teacher and with your and with your peers is important. So I believe they do matter. Um, and, and getting 459 kids back, the, if we approve this tonight, 459 kids back. But I will agree with you, uh, Mr. Simpson, if guidelines change and if we are looking at um, at a shift, then I, you know, I think we need to reevaluate. But step one, I would like to see 459 kids get back uh, versus denying the whole thing. That is, versus changing the motion, um, and, or versus not having any of them back at all. I agree with Karen. Thank you. And my, I guess part of my logic is you could invite them all back, and you may not get 459 back. You know what I mean? So it's like that. Sure. It's mm -hmm. kind of in a way the car comes from the horse because we don't know the data. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I do know I've talked to some parents and it's, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what you guys decide. My kids know what's back. Right. And, you know, so it's like we, if we had that data, I think we, we could make a more informed decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you. Yep. Do you have another one? Well, then let me complicate things because at this point I'd like to amend my motion. I'd like to amend it that we return to K through six to five days a week. Have a second? I'll second it. Right. So yeah, but they can't fit. At the, at the, at the, the, right, the guidelines that we're at now, the six feet, if they could fit, we would have had them all. They can't afford to go to three. They will? They can't afford to go to three. And we'll have to we'll work have to out that. Three. Three. We still have to vote on. We still have to vote on this. This is not. I'm just making an amended motion. He still to vote on the. He said a second. Um, so the, the conversation. He still has to vote on his amendment. So, yeah, my. I, I guess my. Um, I'm. I'm with you. I would. I would rather have them all in than just being in two teams just coming in. I have a. And I know that everybody's done a great job of talking about it, but I still. It's still a tangle for me. Um, Signature. Stigmatization, the, I don't feel like it's an equitable plan um, as far as it isn't fair to all the kids. I realize that some kids need more than others and that that's what you're considering when you're talking about equity. But, um, it, you know, you're talking about one kid in one family that might be able to go and then two, then two siblings stay home. And it's just creating a dynamic that is a negative dynamic that is just going to further traumatize and stigmatize these children. And, that's my fear. Um, but I do, I mean, it, it was changed to three, but then my question to you is, what about lunches now? Because they still have to be six feet apart to eat. Whether that's two to three feet or not, we still have to eat. Can that be accommodated? I don't think it can be. I think from what we heard tonight, that's what we're holding, that was, that's what we're holding back. Um, that's the challenge right there, is feeding, or lunches need to start. At 9 a.m. and um, go on way. So at this point, what I'm going to do is call for a motion, call for a vote on the amendment um, to the motion for five days. So all those in favor for the amendment 
and a motion to bring pitch back five days a week. Um, all those in favor? One, two, three. Motion does not pass. Okay. So we're back to the original motion, uh, which was to approve the recommendations of the reentry committee as they apply to pre-K through six. So at this point, I'm going to call for um, any or further discussion. Let me make sure you're wrapped up. Can we ask who made that motion? Who made the motion, Mr. Chair? I made the original motion, and I also made the amendment. I just want to say the reason I didn't agree with that is because there's no plan. You know, it's just let's bring them in, but there is nothing that has been set in stone as far as how we're going to do this. So I think it's, and I know it's not my lane to be dictating how it's done, but I would also, as you all know, I like to ask a lot of questions, and my question is how would this be done? How would they eat? We don't have a crystal ball. We've got to deal with what we've got right now in front of us. And right now in front of us um, are the guidelines that we have in front of us. Uh, those haven't changed right now at 9, whatever time it is right now. So, yes, I realize next week, <laughs> right, I know. So next week something can, be di something can be different, but we've got to deal with what's in front of us right now. Can, can we make a motion that they go back and then if they change... CDC is three feet. Then we can move on to that. So that is that. Is that something? Well, that would have to that would have to come back as an amended motion to the original, mm -hmm. and based on new information. Based on new information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, then I guess we could take another vote. If it did change, then we could official you know, vote for that. So, so you could amend the motion that's on the table right. Revise it to say that should the CD guidelines change to a three feet, that all students would return by using the effective ticket day, April, what she was about, April 5th, April 5th, or something. Like the, the first of the quarter. Or oh, whatever date they would, yeah, that would be earlier. Well, the. Go ahead, absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking right at you. Go ahead. Uh, the only thing that would have to change is the fact that the six foot would have to change for lunch. Because mm -hmm. we already know that we can do three foot in the classroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. So the only thing that would have to change is we could say that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah, no. but make this uh, make an amendment to the motion that say that should the CDC rules change lowering the standard for lunches to three foot, then we would move the schools back automatically to a participation. But is the CDC making that rule, or is that the DOE on the lunch call? The federal CDC, the federal CDC is okay. studying it now. And then the DOE would have to adopt those guidelines. CDC, national CDC has to make that decision. Main DOE needs to accept those guidelines. Yeah, so I'd like to make that amendment. Well, question, though. But how are the other schools doing? Right. That doesn't make sense. So they are eating six feet apart. Um, so I call the difference. Mm -hmm. And all the other schools mm -hmm. are all six feet apart? Mm -hmm. They are eating six feet apart. They accept the federal money, so when they signed on the dotted line, they are eating six feet apart. They are. I, I called probably, called or emailed probably eight different um, people in eight different districts today. Yeah. Abby? So just to clarify the hypothetical three feet change, if it were to happen next week or sometime, um, for the elementary school, it would be the three feet. But for like Edward Little, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was we are okay to A cohort and B cohort to return while staying six feet. So would that three feet rule be in effect for all schools regardless, just so everyone's on the same page or just elementary to get everybody back? I don't think it would affect you because you're coming in five days a week. So you could then, instead of having to say six feet apart from your friends while you're eating, you could actually go three feet apart, would be like a typical day in the school having lunch, I believe. Does that make sense? 
Um, maybe you could eat the cafeteria. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, so I'm a little lost at this point. Um, we have the original motion. Dan, you want to amend the motion to say that, so the, the motion is to approve the recommendation of the re-entry committee as they apply to grades 3K through 6 with an amendment that should the, I guess we should call them COE guidelines. Yeah, we guidelines or CDC guidelines? What do we have to go by? Guidelines currently say three to six feet. For lunch, too? No. No. Just for, right. So if you're talking about just lunch. If they're saying three to six on everything else, we're good. The lunch specifically. And they eat in their class. Right now they're eating in class, so they're six feet apart. So that's why. The only thing we need to worry about is changing the guidelines for the For the lunch. And how are we going to do that? Like, I know that there's talk about um, the, the, the change in distance of three to six, um, but has that also encompassed eating three feet apart? I don't know. Three or six feet. They can, they can, if they can sit three feet apart in the classroom, then they can eat three feet apart. Unless their masks are off. Yeah, their masks are off. They have to. They, if their masks are off, they have to be six feet apart when they're eating. But yeah, they can sit with their masks. They're changing, and that's what we. So we don't know if they're changing that. We don't. So we don't what we're it. saying, Dan is making a proposal. However, should the yes. should the, the mandates or the guidelines, whatever you want to call them, around um, the eating for or the CDC guidelines, DOE guidelines, change to three feet, um, then we would support the full reentry um, of pre K through six. Yes. And Brian is Brian Carrier is seconding the amendment. So now I'm going to ask for a vote. All those in favor? I have a question, though. I'm sorry to make more confusing. I know. I have a question. When you make this I amendment, almost got it in. I know. <laughs> sorry. When you make this amendment, mm -hmm. are you saying that we agree with what has been um, given to us today as putting in the kids that are, or just the kids that are chosen, and then if it changes, we have them all? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. So, but we didn't even decide if we want that right. or not. That's right. That first we, motion. We can't because we amended it. We can't vote on that yet because Dan amended it. So now that there's an amendment there, now we've got to vote on his amendment. And we vote on the overall. Then we vote everything else. Okay. Yeah. I took a test on Robert's rule. Mr. Simpson. No, I'll let you know how we are. Oh, Abby. Sorry. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, just to throw it out there, um, double masking is now a thing. I feel that if we do move to three feet, it should be recommended. But I know that the guidelines say within three to six, so obviously it would be okay. But I just feel like double masking would be should be recommended, not forced, but it should be an idea I've thought about. It's been pretty. Um, uh, diligent to the guidelines that are passed down to us. Um, so if that's one of them that comes with, you know, any changes to the spacing, then we will, we're not going to uh, break any rules of law here. I feel like, I feel like that should be two motions. I mean, I know we amended it. I know there's an amendment, but I feel that, um, I have to do, we've got to, we've got to do this one right now. We're going to vote on the other one after him. Yes. We're still going to vote on two. We're this yeah, this is just for his amendment. Yeah, we oh. the yeah we're going to vote on the... But his amendment says that we are voting for this, the, for the set, having just certain kids come in. So what's, what's presented no. today? Is this, a, is this what we're voting on? No. What's presented today as well as the amendment to change it if the rules change? So we're voting on all students pre K through six. No, we're voting on all kids pre K through six coming back full time. If the CDC do a guidelines for eating lunch within three feet come into effect, okay. and then we're going to vote on what they presented. Okay. Then we vote on the bigger one and says yes or no. Okay. So right now we're going to vote on the amendment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hands and feet to the right at all times. We vote. All right. So. We're going to vote on the amendment that Dan no, does. Is that a question you're voting? Is that a question you're voting? I'm going to make an amendment to Dan to say no sooner than April 5th. 
for a full return if there's a change in the CDC guidelines. That's what he said. Yeah. Oh, okay. you got it. Didn't know that. I'm like, oh my God, did you know what he said? No, I didn't. All right. So, all those in favor of Dan's amendment, uh, saying none opposed, that amendment passes. So now we have just added on, just kind of packed it in there. Thank you. All right. So now. Um, we're going to go back to the original. Uh, now, we, you've been taking copious notes here. So, read back this next, this next one that we're going to vote on. There's a group of kids that pre-K to set the entry of that motivation. Absolutely. As an amendment. As an amendment. Students would return five days a week if the CDC guidelines change each week for the Didn't we just decide it was CDD, CDC slash DOE? Because we just said that it was the DOE that we're following, that they're, they give us the money. Well, um, so just to say your point, we do have an MOA or a citizens association that they refer to the NDOE's guidelines system. So that would be the sort of guideline that we have. All those in favor? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just okay. So I just don't want to vote on the wrong thing. Right. So what's happening now, Pam, is that we're about, we've already done the amendment. That is all done. So now we are voting to step one: bring 459 kids back. The struggling kids. Yes. Those 459 high support kids. If, when the DOE guidelines change. Do that's freaky. All of them can come back with. And I'd like to make an amendment that we, because we made. No, so we have to like make your amendment. Right. Then we have to have the discussion. I'd like to make an amendment that we vote on whether or not we want um, high needs kids coming back um, first, and then we can also make vote on. Bringing them all back in if the CDC changes its rules to three feet. So I'd like to make an amendment that we vote as it was, um, as far as the plan that was presented to us from the reentry, which is just bringing back the struggling kids and not all the kids. And then if we vote on that, yes or no, and then we should also have that plan of. of if the CDC changes its rules and we can have three seats, then we can bring all the kids back. Yes, we did vote on it, but we're lumping it in with the bringing them in, um, just bringing in a certain amount of kids now. Step one, and then if the CDC year we drive on change, then it becomes all of them. I just put up. They're together. That's the motion now. That's the motion on that here now. You can. You can choose to vote no. You well, no, I, because I'm, I'm torn. I, I honestly, I'll, I'll be transparent. I was, I was going to vote no on the elementary plan of bringing only a certain amount of kids in, just because I don't feel like it's an equitable plan. I think it's going to be nice kids. That's my belief. That's from also from constituents who have I've spoken to. That's their belief as well. But. I would vote if that if the guidelines change and they go to three feet and we can bring all the kids back and that way we're not picking and choosing, there's no stigmatization, everyone's getting a chance to come back, then I would vote yes on that. So that's, that's where my confusion is. Okay. So that's what that's not where the motion is right now. The motion is bring back the four hundred and fifty nine and if guidelines change, then all of that. So that's that's the motion. And can we change that? You just vote on two different things? Do that way, if I be right? Yeah. No, no yours went through. Of course. You, it has to be voted you can do another amendment, but at this point, in all honesty, it would be voting it up or down. Mm -hmm. It would be the way to go. Uh, but 
you can add another amendment. And then we have to, we have, to have a second, and then we'll vote on that part of the amendment, and then we have to come back. We're still going to have to vote on the overall we'll amendment that we're bringing. It's still here. X number of people back now. So you can make your amendment for me. Because I feel like they're two different things. They're two right. different motions in a way. Because if you're bringing your... What? It, it's the same thing as you just voted on for AMS, though. Of a what? For Auburn Middle School. You voted back... And, and, and I'm, no, no, I'm saying about picking just a certain number of kids that are identified as struggling. Correct? Well, there are three options for middle schoolers. Yes. Yeah. Two for elementary. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, there are three. We All our students have to come to school. So if they don't come full time, they either have to take a remote option or, or a, uh, or come in on the cohorts. That's the, the three options. It, it's the high school that has two options because it's all oh, in or, or, or it's out. My point was just that if the Auburn Middle School only takes back a certain number of children, it's the same me method, but you know they're going to identify which kids come back if they're not all coming back, correct? The majority of them are coming back. It's not just... So, uh, I just want to make a comment and then an argument against Pam for a minute. <laughs> so, my comment is, I think, I think the elementary staff teachers did an amazing job coming up with legitimate criteria to bring back students that I don't like the word struggling. There, it's an opportunity um, to to argue against you, Pam, I think we're being more inequitable keeping these kids at home and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I can look myself in the mirror and go, you know, if, if we're, if we're going to deem these kids because we're bringing them back as inequity, for me, I can, I can handle that. For me, I can't handle doing nothing. You know, I think at 27 to 30% of struggling kids, if we do nothing, I, I think that's worse than if we give these kids an opportunity. We give these parents an option, an opportunity. Is it the right stepping stone? Yeah, it's a stepping stone. I like the amendment that Dan made. I would love to see all these kids back. I'd love to see the CDC DOE change to three feet. That's why I voted for all kids and all kids. I'd like to see all kids go back to middle school, high school, and, and elementary. But again, it goes back to I think we're being more inequitable keeping these kids at home and knowing that we're keeping them home than to give them an opportunity for it back. 459 kids is a lot of kids. 459 kids that are in, that meet some criteria. Which I, again, I think the criteria is fantastic. I mean, it, it, it's not based on star scores. It's not based on you know a one or two. It's based on a, on a great selection of criteria that that the staff and the administrators put together as an opportunity to identify the kids that they feel would deserve extra help, extra need, extra support, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Whether it's school age, whether it's emotional needs, whether it's you know whatever it might be. So I I, I actually really uh, you know acknowledge the fact that they spent too much time to really come up with great criteria. I think this is what, maybe back on what you said to Brian, this is what they're gearing up for, these 459 kids. Um, I think that's what they're gearing up for. That's right. So when she, she did a nice job with the presentation, I kept thinking of the word engagement. Mm -hmm. Not failing, not this. It's like kids that we would, would like the opportunity to improve our engagement with. Um, I was going to shout it out to her, but I didn't. <laughs> I don't think I... I I, have, I just wanted to comment. Um, I don't think voting no against this is doing nothing because I think that a lot of these teachers have done a phenomenal amount of work and they still do. That even if kids are coming in two days a week, they are providing things that they need. Um, and to say that if they come in two more days a week, that they're going to get, and, and I, I get it, they're going to get more one on one, but I'm I'm sorry, I don't think it's doing nothing. So it's a double opportunity to be in school for my job. All right, so let's take a vote on the motion with the amendment. Um, and Dr. Brown, could you read it one more time, please? So this is a move to approve the recommendations of the reentry committee for pre K through grade six, as amended by Dan Kassan, and that is that all kids would return five days a week if the CDC slash MDA guidelines change to three feet for lunches no sooner than April 6th. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, 
motion passes. Thank you for that long conversation. I appreciate hearing um, all of your thoughts on that one. All right, moving down to policy. We're going to under new business policy AC-R, the grievance procedure for persons with disabilities. Can I obtain a motion to approve, please? Um, sorry, Donna. Thank you. Pam, I'll take your second. Any questions or comments on that one? And none. And the vote, please. All those in favor? Thank you. Motion passes. All right, the school year calendar. Dr. Brown, can you walk us through the 21-22 school year calendar? Sure. This is our first reading for the 21-22 calendar. This is the product of the area superintendents looking at the calendar for the Lewis Region, Lewis, Lewis and Region Technical Center because we can have no more than five dissimilar days. So as you can see, there's a legend that would tell you when the kids would begin, uh, that would be September 1, and we start with two teacher workshop days in August. Uh, we would go through until June 14 or 15. I did turn it to staff and I asked them how the remote days are going, and I got a great response. And what I recommend to you is that we would use three days for traditional snow days, and anything after that would be some remote days. So those are the results of the new calendar. So we we'll are also referring back to snow days. Three, three, three. So we sort of, um, the consensus was, I got a lot of feedback for both, for both, for remote as well as for traditional snow days. And so that was sort of the, the middle ground, where people said, how about some of both? So that's what I'm proposing. The first three, and this would, I think, help families as opposed to was it a remote day or was it a snow day. So the first three will always be a traditional snow day and have to be made up. And then the next day, regardless of how many there are, would be remote days. Okay, so that prevents pushing sometimes school all the way until June into the 20s. Yes, it does. Okay, all right. That's a great plan. All right, okay. So can I entertain a motion? Let me find that page. Entertain a motion to Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, did Lewiston, didn't they just add two holidays to theirs? They added uh, one down the road. I don't know the second one that they added. Two on the news. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, know they I didn't know. Did we, add, did we add them too? I mean, no. no. Okay. Those are one of the five dissimilar days that we that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, I think it's the news that they added, and I don't know, I don't know if there's a second one. Yeah. Okay. Have you looked into adding more inclusive holidays at all? Uh, my goal is to try to match the calendars of the other area school districts. And the more holidays that you step out to, to change, the more dissimilar days you have. So you have to try to make those up some other spring. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, can I say a motion to approve the proposed school calendar? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Second. 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 Okay. Uh, I think we just had the second on a little bit, so let's call for a vote. All those in favor? And those opposed? The carrier opposes? Motion passes. Thank you. All right, so that's the last thing on this agenda this evening. Upcoming meetings next week, March 24th, is a full budget workshop and school committee discussion. And the March 31st meeting um, has been canceled. Don't believe we will need that one. All right. Uh, future agenda items or requests for information at this time? Go ahead, Bill. No. Okay. Um, as we get an amendment to the middle of the, the elementary school, mm -hmm. um, and I know this is totally out of order and totally not about this school at all, um, just for the next, when we do the next agenda or whatever, if we do get word that we need to go to a three, I would propose that we would also look at the middle school and bringing that all to the same school. Okay, thank you. Sir. All thank right. You. Any other requests for information? Carrier? The uh, I'm not sort of nitpicking at this point. Uh, one of the questions that I'd ask about the unfunded positions. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. Funded unfilled positions. And I was wondering what the cost 
what the overall cost would be for those. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm not doing it very well, am I? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd like to know how much we would spend. You bring that? No. They're funded already. I want to know how much of that is funded. I, I know it's 100%, but. If I took those positions out, what's the value of those positions? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your reminds. <laughs> All right. Any other requests for information? All right. Seeing none, can I entertain a motion to adjourn, please? Second. 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 All those in favor? I'm not even looking up. Motion to pass. Motion to pass. Adjourn. 8.59 p.m. Thank you all for the conversation this evening.